the 2023 meeting of the Town of Nisku and the Planning Board and Zoning Commission. Mr. Henry, would you please call the roll? Mr. LaFleur. Here. Mr. Scrabby Tennis is excused and absent. Mr. Kahn. Here. Mr. McPartland. Here. Mr. Darpino. Here. Ms. Gold. Present. Ms. Strang. Here. Mr. Drescher. Here. Chairman Walsh. Here. Thank you. Okay, first up, we have the approval of the minutes from the March 13th, 2023 meeting that were included in your packet. Can I have a motion for approval of those minutes? So moved. Moved by Mr. McPartland for approval. Do I have a second? Second. And second by Mr. Kahn. Any uh, changes? The minutes? I have none. Uh, nice job. Anybody have anything? Okay, hearing no changes to minutes. All those in favor of approval of the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Sorry, I wasn't present for those, so okay. I'm standing. All right, thank you. All right, the minutes are from March 13th, 2023 approved. Next, we have a public hearing, um, a public hearing for 1851 Union Street, 1245 Ruffin Road, and that's the Mohawk Golf Club, pretty average density development, uh, which includes 10 single family detached homes and 12 townhomes. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have uh, Mr. Henry read the notice like we always do. After the notice is read, we'll have the applicant uh, come to the podium and summarize uh, just touch on a few points. I know a lot of you people have been following this very closely, so you're very familiar. And then what we'll do is we'll open the public hearing. For the public hearing, we'll start because there's quite a few people and some out there. And if that overflows, we have some people that'll be upstairs. So we'll start in this room. So anybody wants to be heard, we'll start here. Then we'll move uh, to the uh, uh, out there to the other room and then upstairs, and then we'll go virtual. So make sure everybody gets a chance to talk. After we get through all that, if somebody else has another comment, we'll, we'll welcome that uh, and we'll handle it that way. A uh, reminder that uh, we, uh, 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 try to limit uh, conversation or uh, comments uh, to five minutes. And that seems to be more than enough time, but uh, there's a light on there, a warning light when you're approaching it and a red light when you hit your five minutes. So I appreciate we, uh, we kind of move along because we got a lot of people here. So with that said, and I appreciate everybody coming tonight, Mr. Henry, would you please read the notice? Notice is hereby given that pursuant to the zoning ordinance of the town of Niskeyun in New York and the applicable provisions of the town law of the state of New York, a public hearing will be held by the Planning Board and Zoning Commission of the Town of Niskayuna in the Town Board Meeting Room at 1 Niskayuna Circle on the 27th day of March 2023 at 7 p.m. to consider an application from Matthew Moberg, agent for Michael Rutherford, for a special use permit application for a 22 lot average density development subdivision, 10 single family homes, and 12 townhomes at 1851 Union Street and 1245 Ruffner Road in the town of Niskayuna. The properties are located in the R1 Low Density Residential Zoning District. A copy of the Average Density Development Special Use Permit and Subdivision Sketch Plan application will be available for inspection at the Planning Department in the Niskayuna Town Hall and can be viewed at the town's website under the News and Announcement tab and will be shown electronically during the public hearing. If you wish to express an opinion regarding the public hearing, you may do so at the above mentioned time and place. If you cannot be present, you may request a virtual login to the meeting by emailing lrobertson at niskuna.org or calling the, the town phone number, or you may, be, you may set forth your opinion in a letter which will be made part of the permanent record. Please note that there is a five minute time limit for each speaker at the public hearing and submitted letters will not be read out loud at the public hearing, but such letters will be included in the minutes and added to the record. The Planning Board and Zoning Commission of the Town of Niskayuna will hear all persons interested during the aforementioned public hearing. By order of the Planning Board of the Town of Niskayuna, New York, Kevin A. Walsh, Chairman, Planning Board and Zoning Commission. Thank you, Mr. Henry. So with that, uh, the applicant, would you like to step up and just give a quick overview? I appreciate that. I say I think uh, the public is pretty familiar, but uh, just touch on the, the key points. My name is Dave Kimmer from ABD Engineers. I'm at the Mohawk Golf Club. 
And tonight, uh, we're presenting for a public hearing for an average density development, which includes 10 single family homes and 12 town homes on about 14 acres of vacant land on the Mohawk Golf Club. Um, it's adjacent to Rutherford Road. We are planning on coming in with a new town road off an existing paper street off Rutherford Road. You want me to repeat? Uh, just faster, maybe. Okay. Sorry. Uh, connection. Okay. How do I sound? <laughs> Better. Better. Okay. Um, so this is a, a twenty-two lot average density development with a new cul-de-sac road off a of Ruffner Road off an existing paper street. The 22 lots consist of 10 single family and 12 um, shared uh, townhomes. And uh, being that it's an average density development, uh, the lot sizes are smaller than regular single family homes. Some of them are anyway, and it includes uh, about three acres of conservation area. Um, including a 50-foot buffer from the, the rear yards of the homes on Ruffner Road and about a 200, 200 to 300 uh, foot or so uh, section of woods that will be undisturbed. Um, there will also be a stormwater management area uh, on the western part of the por parcel, which will be uh, incorporated into a water feature that will be maintained by the golf course. Um, utilities will connect out on Ruffner Road through an emergency access route, which actually utilizes an existing 20 foot easement that touches our parcel. Um, that's, that's where water will be connected. Sewer, we're planning on connecting out through where the road is to uh, the line that runs south on Ruffner Road. Um, I think that's about all there is to it. You know, obviously I'm here to answer any further questions. Uh, this the plan hasn't changed since we presented it to the board last. Um, I guess I'll give it back to you guys. Okay, thank you. And um, yes, plan plan hasn't changed, and uh, there's more engineering to be done. Basically, we're at the point in the process where uh, public hearing, and then next up would be a, a discussion, which is on the agenda for later tonight. So uh, we'll be talking about the project later uh, tonight. After okay. okay, thank you. All right. All right, so with that said, we're gonna open the public hearing, uh, the public hearing for um, the Mohawk Golf Club for this average density development. So we'll start with anybody in the room here that would like to speak, please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and we'll listen to what you have to say. So the public hearing is open. Thank you. Um, my name is George Young. I live at 1241 uh, Ruffner Road. Um, I wanted to make a few points, both um, myself and my family strongly oppose this development. And then uh, two, de two detailed points on this plan. Um, the current plan is to use a paper road uh, near 1219 Ruffner Road, um, and also to put a third road behind that house. And I feel like a home that was purchased uh, and improved, which is currently in the middle of a quiet street, to surround that by three roads is really out of character for the neighborhood uh, and the town. And it really places undue burden on that home. So I'd like the board to really consider the impact on that house. Um, secondly, um, I wanted to note that uh, the plan currently uh, proposes to use um, my driveway as emergency access. And um, I have a written letter into the town planning board and publicly I'd like to notify you that I, I claim this property and the town cannot grant use of this land to MGC golf operations or any other entity. And um, my claim to this land, I believe meets the five requirements uh, outlined in the adverse possession laws of New York state. And those are um, that the claim is adverse and hostile. The claim is actual. I exercise direct control over this property. Um, it's exclusive. I've used this property for over 10 years, uh, open and notorious. And again, I've um, exercised these factors 
in excess of the statutory period of 10 years. I also wanted to note to the board that there's significant case law that would support this cl claim. Uh, the details are in the letter, uh, but the relevant New York State case law includes Waterview Towers Inc. versus 2610 Cropsey Development Corp, um, Goss versus Trombley, and Best versus Haircutters Limited. But in all these cases, um, a disputed um, parcel of land used for access, uh, the New York State courts have, have uh, decided in favor of the homeowner. Uh, so because of that, I'm requesting the town planning board reject the special use permit uh, requested by MGC Golf Operations and please contact me uh, at the address that I've provided if you have any other uh, additional information or questions on my claim. Um, I'd lastly note that I've initiated a, a quiet title action in regards to this matter and hope that I can resolve this soon. Okay, thank you, Dr. Young. And we did all receive copies of that, and so did the town employees. So thank you. Great. Next up. Good evening. Uh, my name is Josh Spain. Uh, my three boys and I live at 1219 Ruffner Road. Um, along with my comments tonight, I've submitted a letter to Laura and Clark, and I know that they've been forwarded to the board. So uh, rather than reading the full letter, I'm just going to do my best to summarize and hit some of the key points. Uh, for starters, as I emphasized when I addressed the planning board uh, in late February, I, I oppose the development of 13 acres. I oppose any main access roadway and any emergency roadway along Lefner Road. Uh, I spoke at length in my address to the board in February about my concerns that this development will do irreparable harm to the character of our Ruffner Road neighborhood, as well as that of the surrounding neighborhoods. Today, my opinion and stance on this has only grown stronger. Uh, you've heard from so many, including me, that this development will harm a thriving ecosystem which serves as the habitat for an extensive amount of wildlife, plant life, and trees. That ecosystem, that wildlife, that habitat, they all contribute to the rich history and character of our neighborhoods, removing the demolition of a home, Changing the location of the main access roadway does not change that. Um, I see the Mohawk Club and their engineering firm have submitted a long form environmental assessment. Uh, I also understand there are many technical elements of the project, including all the infrastructure requirements that have yet to be worked out. Engaging a town designated engineer for this process is critical and I know a TDE has been selected, so that's great. It's just critical that this TDE be given you know, the, the appropriate amount of time, no matter what the expense, and that TDE's work has to be thoroughly scrutinized. Uh, where they may not have the expertise or the authority to assess certain elements of the project and the environmental assessment, the appropriate agencies and authorities really should be engaged in all this, whether it's Army Corps of Engineers for wetlands, DOT for roads and traffic, New York State DEC uh, for assessing true impact on habitat and wildlife that have been highlighted by so many. Furthermore, if any deficiencies are, are found with any of the infrastructure required to support this, that cost should be covered solely by the developer. None of those costs should be passed on to us, the taxpayers. Um, the latest plan being presented by Mohawk Club lacks important details that would provide all of us the necessary information, some necessary information on the newly proposed main access roadway. So I, I, I do have to ask, and, and if you look at the sketch, why aren't homes depicted on the parcels near the new road? Why aren't the driveways depicted on the parcels near the new road? Why isn't there the width of the new road designated there? The distance between the parcels? Um, you know, there's a lot of details that were provided in the original plan that aren't provided where this new road is gonna sit. I, you know, I can only guess that it's either because this proposal is now being rushed or because that information is only gonna cause more concern and negative comments from my neighbors and I and frankly, it only reinforces the lack of trust that we have in the Mohawk Golf Club. It's critical that this planning board hold the Mohawk Club to a very high standard throughout this process, and it already feels like shortcuts are being taken on their part. The last point I'd like to make here is very personal for my boys and I. This paper street borders on our property to the south, space that my neighbor, Marty Laux, and I have maintained as if our own for greater than 20 years. Marty for much longer than that. Most, if not all residents of our neighborhood had no idea that Paper Street even existed there. It doesn't mean that I have a right to own it and take it over, but it does speak to the character and the nature of the, uh, of the, of, of the 
of the neighborhood. Um, it's a tribute to the great care we've taken with that property, how it blends in with and is part of the natural normal landscape of our own properties and of the entire neighborhood. Take a quick look at the sketch for this proposal. And I think you've already heard it. One glaring element is that our residence would not just be a corner lot with a street in the front and the side, but it essentially becomes a peninsula with roadways on three of the four sides. Is that even legal? Is there precedent for this in the town? We heard a lot about precedent about tearing a house down, but what about surrounding an existing house with three roads? Um, it'll most certainly negatively impact my property value. It'll clearly, uh, you know, it would clearly undo burden my property and my home, which goes against specific language that's in the comprehensive plan for the town. So thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to have my voice and the voices of the neighbors heard tonight uh, to help inform you on these important decisions that are still to come. With that, I urge the planning board to not recommend the approval of the requested special use permit to the Nisky Unit Town Board. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Therese Asalian, 2342 Algonquin Road. Um, I live in Cayuga Hills, so I am not Ruffner Road, but I, um, and because of that, I have the luxury of some distance. So I can sort of view what's going on here and I could, I've been taking in the comments and, um, you know, I'm really struck by the stories of my Ruffner Road neighbors, and a lot of them have shared what purchasing their home had meant to them, why they were drawn, <clears throat> excuse me, to Niskayuna. We all have our, our stories of how we found our homes. Uh, I fled Half Moon uh, in 2013, uh, rampant uh, development, no trees, tons of vinyl houses, insane traffic, overcrowded schools, 10,000 plus kids there right now. Um, two things that I, I keep thinking about, keep going back to for these homeowners on Ruffner. When they purchase their home, whenever you purchase a home, uh, if there's a large uh, tract of land behind you, one always needs to think about what could potentially happen here, right? There is no way that any of the people on Ruffner could have had any reasonable expectation of what this proposal entails. So what is a reasonable expectation? for these homeowners, certainly not this, certainly not that there's gonna be two gashes put through this historic, pristine neighborhood. No, that's beyond the scope of what is a reasonable expectation for that property. Not that it wouldn't be developed, but that in this way, okay? So it's just not reasonable to expect that when purchasing. And if you rubber stamp this, what do you do next? What happens to other homeowners when they come in in this, you know, should they be worried that a tract of land behind them, they could just like carve a road through? It's just not fair. I also think about um, when everybody um, probably don't read our deeds that much, but if you read the deed to your property, every deed ha has a language um, upon transfer of ownership rights, the right to quiet enjoyment of your property. That's in your deed, that's a covenant. This is, will not be quiet, nor will it be enjoyable. Um, I don't fault or you know, I'm not taking issue with the actions of developers because I think a lot of developers are, you know, kind of you could take one and replace it with another and you'd have the same kind of result, right? They want fast. They want the least money. They want as much housing as they can squeeze into the tiniest lot, regardless of infrastructure or other um, they get to walk away, they're houses, okay? We're talking about homes and they're into houses and they're gonna walk away and we're gonna be left with what remains. Um, I also want to ask you, the planning board, um, what, when I moved to New Skiuna, I thought, I told people, you know, everybody I know want, went to Clifton Park. I went the other way, people thought I was nuts. Why would you leave Saratoga County and come to Niskayuna where you know you pay like 40, 50 percent higher taxes. Um, I know so many people that have. Moved, I keep saying, "Come to Niski, come to Niski," and they're like, "No way, man! The taxes are outrageous. I'll never go there." And off they go up the north way. Um, and I was involved when I lived there in a group called Future Half Moon that I worked um, to talk about rampant development. Uh, a lot of good that did. Um, just drive down 146, and pretty soon it's going to be you know it's like Rockland County or Long Island. Um, 
my question to the planning board, because this, this whole thing is making me think, because I do have some experience with planning, what is your obligation? Why, if we think NISKI is progressive, what is this planning board showing us to prove anything to do with anything progressive as far as planning? Um, for example, impact fees. A lot of municipalities have them. Why do they have them? Because there's negative impact on not just the infrastructure, the schools, the town services, fire, ambulance. Don't I know that you're smarter than accepting that more development equals a bigger tax base, because we know that's a lie. Um, it's a negative impact. A lot of municipalities will charge a developer a certain amount per unit and put it into a fund. Has that is that something that you would consider? I think you should consider a moratorium while you sit back and think about what are we doing here, planning board? Um, what kind of progressive planning can we can we do? Um, what kind of housing options might people really want? Um, I worry for my children that if I did stay in this unit, that they wouldn't be able to ever come back here because many people today, young people, they can't afford to buy, um, you know, uh, first home, first time home buyers are really feeling the squeeze. So I'm just going to end with, because of my time's running out, um, about some of the progressive planning tools that I believe that you should be looking at. I think you should start with a moratorium, put a pause on things, think about impact fees, put it into some kind of like an account. Maybe that can be used for, even Saratoga County has Saratoga plan where I would look at like, what are the five, 10, 15 plus acre parcels left in this town? Need to summarize, I'm wrapping please. up. Today's Wall Street Journal, Journal article on New York is poised to ban natural gas in buildings. Senator Brian Kavanaugh says the premise is if you continue to build buildings that are going to require fossil fuels for decades to come, you're baking in destructive behavior um, that burning fossil fuels causes. And that's just my point of let's be a little bit progressive here and think about some planning tools, think about the climate, think about the residents here. And to my Ruffner Road neighbors, thank I'm with you. Th thank you. We need to move along. We appreciate you. Power comments. to the people. Hi, I'm Mark Thomas at 1265 Ruffner Road. And Mostly, I just want to get up here and, and reassert uh, my and my wife's uh, strong opposition for the development of the 14 acres behind Ruffner Road. Um, the nice lady from Algonquin, I'm sorry I didn't get your, get your name. Therese, Therese thanks. Um, kind of said what I had prepared here. Um, you know, let's uh, double the density of half of this space behind us. Uh, twice as many people per square foot, less privacy. What would be the town's rationale for changing the rules so that this neighborhood will become more dense, more crowded, lower in our quality of life? Talk about a lousy precedent. A lot was said about the president of, of knocking down a house. But hey, if we do this, let, let's punch a hole in every nice street in this, you know, the wooded area behind it, cut down the trees, drive out the wildlife and put in duplexes. Is that what this unit wants to be going forward? We all know that it's widely recognized NISQ unit is a sought after zip code because we're different than Clifton Park. Nice, low density, single family, private residence where families thrive. And nobody will convince us that property values will increase as a result of trying to squeeze as much real estate on as little surface area possible using duplex units. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Maddie McCarthy, 1237 Ruffner Road. I've lived in Niskuna all my life. My family moved to Ruffner Road when I was going into kindergarten. And to be honest, I think I had an incredible childhood. I was able to travel to my friends' houses, able to run, walk, bike, longboard, anything without worry of major traffic. And I was able to observe such a diverse range of wildlife, which I'm able to do today, thankfully. But Unfortunately, that might not be the case after this whole development. And, you know, I was really 
really proud of this town growing up, but unfortunately, as time has gone on, I've become very disappointed in the priorities. Before, it was protecting our town, listening to our neighbors in our community, and protecting our green space. And now all I see are cookie cutter condos, cookie cutter homes, and things that just stand out from the historic neighborhoods around us. Along with that, I want to discuss the deforestation, which would come along with this project. And I'm not sure what everyone knows about deforestation, but it's estimated to be 25% of the total greenhouse gas production. And that's really an issue. And some of the impacts of deforestation are loss of habitat, increased greenhouse gases, water in the atmosphere, soil erosion and flooding, and so much more. And since I do have such a limited amount of time, I do encourage everyone to continue to educate yourselves and read about this issue, as well as listening to your current homeowners, taxpayers, and future homeowners. From the day this project was announced, you've heard from so many people speaking in opposition of the Mohawk Club development. People who've come with their own thoughts, feelings, and opinions. So far, at least, please correct me if I'm wrong, the only people who have come and spoken in favor of this development are those who were asked to by the club. And I think that should say a lot about what this development means to people. This is something that was not asked for. There's not a high demand for it. The demand lies in protecting our town for our current and future generations. So I'll conclude with this. A few meetings ago, one of you mentioned a project that was approved and you regretted it. So I ask you, if you vote in favor of this project, will you regret it? Will you be able to go to sleep at night and know with 100% confidence that you made the right decision to approve this project? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jackson Regan, 1357 Ruffner Road. I'm a Niskina resident attending Siena College, and I don't think it's a surprise statement to say that I think this is a lousy idea and a horribly thought out plan. Let's start with the environmental impacts. I've lived in Ruffner Road since I was in kindergarten, and having walked, biked, and recent years driven past the golf club countless times, uh, I can say that the woodlands around this golf club are full of wildlife. I know that when researching this issue, one representative for the club who conveniently is not here to support his plan uh, said that there was no wildlife. And I think that it's just simply not true. The club is turning a blind eye or they're just not being thorough, which given what I've heard today uh, seems to be a trend. So when you take the environmental impact, that's one bad issue, but let's talk about the money because that's something that the club is quick to point out as to why you should support this plan. Money. This redevelopment development project, they say it's good for tax revenue. And what town in light of COVID isn't trying to boost the revenue? But is destroying a neighborhood's charm and property values really worth theoretically the possibility of more tax revenue? And yes, for all of the homeowners, my parents included, our property value is going to go down. If you've ever driven through our neighborhood, you'll notice one thing about it. It's peaceful. There's very little through traffic. And if you go through, you'll oftentimes find residents walking or biking. It could be a family. It could be a couple. It could be old, young. It's something we love and we're proud about with our neighborhood. It's peaceful and it's quiet. And that's something that I think is true for a lot of Niskuna, seeing as how they're Many different trails that connect Rosendale and Iroquois to River Road. Blackney Park is connected to the Erie Canal uh, towpath. Think about what happens if that plan gets approved. Through traffic, in addition to all those residents being squeezed in that tiny area, in addition to the noise, let's be more practical. It's a safety issue. I know that in my neighborhood, there are so many people who walk and bike, and they might not want to. They might have a lower quality of local life because they want to stay safe because there'll be more cars going through the neighborhood. And it'll be especially true for all of us who live right next to the club. I love biking, but 
if there's more cars for all those homes and anyone who's just cutting through, I don't know if I want to do it. And I want to finish up by saying that I know that there, the planning board and any other local politicians who are part of the town who are here tonight. And you're all here because you were elected to serve Miss Guna, its residents. You're proud of your posts. And this town prides itself on its quiet charm, its natural beauty, its connection to the natural scenery throughout this area of New York. So I'm going to ask you guys, how can you profess to serve the best interests of this town if you're approving a plan that destroys everything that makes Nistiuna what it is? If you have any pride in the natural charm and beauty of this town, you'll recognize that this is just a short-sighted cash grab. And if you care about the residents, as soon as it comes up to a vote, you're going to vote no. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Thank you. Hi, my name's Bob Serrata. We live at 1262 Hawthorne Road, one street over really from where this project may impact a lot of the residents. Uh, 22 homes, 22 families, one or two cars per household. You probably have a much better idea how that will impact the infrastructure in the community. But I'm here really to talk about my friends that you'll displace in this project. The animals that live there on the, the uh, 15 acres. The deer come through my backyard. I'm one street over, they come through my backyard. Last year, I had seven deer and two fox in my backyard at the same time. You know, that's, that's all part of the quality of life of living in this neighborhood beyond Ruffner Road, which will be impacted the most. Two, three weeks ago on Ruffner Road, there was a bald eagle sitting in the tree for three or four hours. I've heard from other people in the neighborhood, people that live in our community, that they've seen bald eagles over in the golf course several times. This, you know, what 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 will impact the uh, infrastructure? That's one thing, but this is wider than that. The outreach of these these animals that come over and they affect the quality of life throughout the whole area, not just Ruffner Road. So, uh, with that, uh, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. Don't displace my friends. Thank you. Hi, Deb Friedson, uh, 2508 Waymer Lane. Um, as I told you at our last meeting, I'm a retired teacher in Niskuna. I have so much pride for my town. I want to take a minute to say, yay you. Where's that other young Wow. Right. Yeah, please address the board, though, okay? I, I apologize. Yeah. I was just looking for it. Yeah. Um, I'm so proud of these kids for you and us to be able to show them how local government works, your patience, your kindness, your, it, this has been tough. And I want to tell you how much I respect this process. I, you know, that I'm very against this. I feel that it's a, a great opportunity to show our kids and, and I raise kindergartners in this area. Now I'm one of the older ones. It's not easy to start facing 70 and realize that I'm one of the older ones. These are the kids that I taught and I'm so proud. So at this age, I can't ride my bike. I can't do the things I used to do, but I do enjoy the peace and quiet and walking my dog along beautiful historic uh, Ruffner Road. I am on Waymer Lane. so. You could say this isn't my fight, but I'm here to support my neighbors because when I fought the end of the street that was broken through when Waymer Lane cut through to um, Ruffner Road, there were people who stood for me. So I'm here for them. And I'm here for our whole community because I live in an old fashioned community where my son lives around the corner. And we just love the environment that we have in our town. Please 
preserve it. Please hear what we are saying. This is why I moved here over 30 years ago, and I plan on staying for as many years as my health will hold. Um, there's a place for us here. There's a place for them there. There's a place for the Eagles. There's a place for all of us. This is not a good idea. This is destroying, again, a neighborhood to put up this. For what? For what? To lose all the faith that we have in you? We're counting on you. Please come through. Thank you so much for hearing my voice. Thank you. Carol Furman. I uh, live at 1269 Ruffner Road. And I am opposed to the plan to develop 22 homes behind Ruffner Road with the only access through a cul-de-sac off Ruffner Road. I don't consider this a small development. There are only 20 homes on Ruffner Road between Linwood and Mountain View Road. This development equals and exceeds this number of homes. So it's, it's a full block of homes. I don't think this number of homes is appropriate for a cul-de-sac. The golf course has been there for a long time and many neighborhoods have developed around it, but it acts as a barrier to free traffic flow and has resulted in concentration of traffic on Ruffner Road already. This proposed plan would further concentrate traffic on Ruffner Road rather than creating a through street and allowing traffic to flow more naturally. This further degrades the character of the quiet residential neighborhood that others have been describing. It also establishes a variation on normal construction of homes where backyards face other backyards and are not exposed to a road on three sides. The plan for emergency access to Ruffner Road does not allow for future development toward Rail Road, where normal north-south traffic flow would occur on a block that was parallel and back onto Ruffner Road. Other variations of the proposed development created an access road for emergencies toward Rail Road, and it allowed space between the homes so that if in the future further development was proposed, a road would even be possible to connect Rail Road through this development and into South Country Club. The proposed development is on land that slopes down behind Ruffner and north toward Rao. Low land in these areas is wet and muddy through much of the year. Removal of trees and increased non-porous surfaces will likely increase the runoff and result in even wetter background, backyards. In addition, I'm concerned about the impact of adding 22 homes to current water and sewer lines on Rupta Road. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable board members, town attorney, fellow Niskina residents, my name is Judd Staley. I live at 1367 Ruffner Court, and I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of myself and my wife, Mary Staley, and let you know that we are steadfastly and unalterably opposed to the development as it has been proposed. I'm not gonna reiterate these very sound arguments that uh, have been made uh, by my neighbors tonight, but I would like to uh, just mention what's most important to our family. And that's the character of the neighborhood. 34 years ago, when we first uh, moved into the neighborhood, we did so because it provided a beautiful variety of architecture, a diversity in the ages of the residents, both older families and new families with young children, the walkability and peacefulness of the neighborhood, 
and the low density and the, the uh, uh, larger and, and very attractive lots. To approve uh, uh, this proposal for average density will change the character of the neighborhood, which would fly in the face of the town's comprehensive plan and probably the new comprehensive plan, which is being worked on right now. I uh, and my family would encourage the board to reject this application for uh, average density development adjacent to Ruffner Road. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, John Baranowski, 1101 Hedgewood Lane. Um, for the many reasons that I've heard uh, from the community over the past few meetings, I, su I, I support their comments in opposition <clears throat> to this uh, application. Um, I'm not going to touch on any of those. I would like to touch on, on one uh, general comment, which does follow up on the gentleman who, who just spoke. Um, I want to address another aspect that makes this application wholly unsuitable. And in doing so, I want to quote two brief passages from the town code, uh, uh, passages that place a significant burden on this board in making a determination about the suitability of an application under the average density development or ADD provision of the town code. I know that all of you are familiar with what I'm going to read, but I'd like to get it into the record anyway. And I'm sure many of, the, of my neighbors um, and townspeople here have become familiar with uh, portions of the town code in, in increasing their education about this application. Uh, so these two brief excerpts are from chapter 220 of town code on what I'll just call ADD, average density development. The first is from 220-28 subsection H1. Such development shall, I'm using that word shall, I'm not using it, it's there, shall not be detrimental to the health, safety, or general welfare of the persons residing in the vicinity or injurious, injurious to property or improvements within its proximity. That word shall is pretty definitive. I don't believe at all that this application is in accordance with this language in your code, in our code. Next, chapter 220-28A. The purpose of this section on ADD is to permit variation in lot size and housing type in suitable areas, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to skip across to the concluding part of this sentence, which says to facilitate, facilitate the adequate and economical provisions of streets, economical provision of streets and to preserve the natural and scenic qualities of open space. Again, I know you know this. I am certainly struck in reading the code by the contradiction between this application and the language of the code here. The proposal that's before you undertakes destruction of open space for the purpose of preserving the natural and scenic qualities of open space. The provision of open space in the applicant's plan makes a mockery of the language of ADD. To make that worse, the size of the destroyed open space is greater by far than the open space that is to be provided by the plan which can be described as, at best as marginal open space. Is that what is intended by ADD? So on its face, this application should be determined to be unsuitable, an, unsu an unsuitable candidate for ADD based on the exact language of chapter 220. Again, preserving the natural and scenic qualities of open space because the application is the opposite of open space. And I go as far as saying that this application has held the attention of the board and the community far past what would be appropriate and should have in an interpretation of town code that is really clear on its face should have been rejected at the initial concept stage. I believe 
and this might sound severe, I believe that the proper course of action at this stage is a definitive and, and the one in, in spirit and letter of the law, and I urge you to dismiss this application. Now, to continue, to, to continue it is to undermine the authority and judgment of the board and to sidestep the very language of town law. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Dillon. I live at 1242 Ruffner Road. And uh, I'm going to take a different angle at uh, talking about this. And I want to build a little bit about what Josh said about difficulty we would have trusting the country club and its motives. <clears throat> Whenever any party puts forth a proposal, okay, that's their right to do so. But when that proposal starts to have an impact on another party, you would hope that the person putting that proposal forth would consider the impact that would have on the other party involved. And I do not feel that it's been the case with this proposal. I don't have to bring you back to some of the early uh, presentations that the board at the country club made. And what struck me was whenever one of you mentioned that they need to consider some other part of their property, the response that they gave you was, no, that's not even on the table. It was like it was sacrosanct that not one extra inch of the golf course could be considered. Why? Because it was historic. Well, when you ask why it was historic, it was, it was 100 years old. It was not a Civil War burial ground. It was not a Civil War battleground. It was a golf course that's been there 100 years. And their original plan was not to touch one inch of that golf course. What they were going to do is they bought a house under questionable circumstances, were ready to knock it down, put in a road where there was no paper road. Why? So then that one inch of that golf course would be touched. And that has been their driving reason behind this whole thing. Why? So that a few hundred people can play golf six months a year. Okay? To achieve that, it would have an impact on people who live there 24-7, year in and year out. So I have a lot of trouble trusting any organization that would do those types of things, that they had no consideration for the people that they were impacting. And they put the needs of a piece of property and golfers about people who have lived in their home for years. And I really felt for you because I felt you were really trying to find a way where the needs could be balanced. And you were basically told, we can't even discuss the golf course. And if you look at this second option, not much is being touched on the golf course. So I think that tells you a little bit of something about the motives behind this. It's not caring about the people that they're putting this burden on so that their golf course is not touched. It's not all the technical stuff, but I do think it's something that needs to be uh, considered. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Carol Holmes, 1301 Ruffner. Um, I've been up here before, so I know I'm a familiar face to you. I wasn't going to speak tonight. It was my goal to sit and keep my mouth shut for once, but here I am. Um, I'm not going to reiterate what you've all heard. You all know where we stand and, and all the, the reasons that us on Ruffner feel that way. Um, but after listening to these two well-spoken young people that spoke tonight, it made me think that maybe that's who we should be listening to. Not your experts, but your future. This is your future of Niskiuna, and they're telling you that this is wrong. These are the people that will be voting for you, that will be keeping our, con our community as it is and what we stand for. Please, if you don't want to listen to us seniors who are probably on the way up, please listen to the young people who are your future and who are what we want Niskiuna to stand for. 
Thank you. Thank you. Ken Schwartz, I'm speaking for myself and my wife, Cindy, 1363 Ruffner Court. Fortunately, we are on a court which protects us from some of this. And you've seen me up here many times because I'm very much opposed to this for everything that was gone on here before. But I think there's a couple things that, that have caught my attention recently besides many of the issues that have been brought up. I was walking my dog, which I do all the time and everybody sees me with my hood on. Um, you walk up Linwood and you hit the 14th tee and what strikes me is, is that our good neighbors on the other side of the fence that says no trespassing. And then you look at this map and if I remember what I read in there, the walkway that goes over to Country Club is going to have a fence along the side and the road is going to have a fence along the side which means don't come near us we want to destroy your neighborhood and we want to do whatever we want in here but you guys can't come near us because we don't want you here because we don't care about you we only care about what we want for our members and most of them don't live in the town they don't pay taxes and they really don't care about the quality. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Christopher Morris. Uh, I live at 1917 Mayfair Road. Um, Chairman Walsh, planning board members, I've submitted this letter um, uh, through email, but I wanted to uh, reiterate it and apologies for reading it so I don't stumble all over my topics. Uh, I wish to express my opposition to the application for development of the Mohawk Golf Club property adjacent to Ruffner Road. My wife and I purchased a home in the Country Club neighborhood in Niskeyuna in late 2021. We were very much drawn to the neighborhood's character of older homes, walkability, proximity to Union Street, and overall family friendliness. While the preferred scheme presented as part of this application doesn't exit directly into our neighborhood, I share the concerns voiced by many of the residents of Rosendale Estates. Um, I'd specifically like to mention a couple of them um, and touch on maybe some other components that uh, others have not yet. Um, specific to the town's comprehensive plan and uh, neighborhood character, uh, the Rosendale Estates neighborhood is one of the most established and desirable in the town. As noted in the first paragraphs of the comprehensive plan, preservation of community character has wide support from the residents. The plan goes on to state that new development should not compromise the integrity of the surrounding neighborhoods. The plan also addresses exterior maintenance, renovation, additions, you know, add-ons to your normal homes and such, saying that those actions should be harmonious with the surrounding streetscape and maintain the neighborhood's cohesive character. They should also ensure the viability of Niskayuna's traditional neighborhoods is maintained. I'd argue that it's reasonable that any new development adjacent to an existing neighborhood receive the same or more, more scrutiny as renovation or an addition. It's my feeling that the proposed, uh, proposed golf club development would not maintain the neighborhood's cohesive character, nor would it ensure the viability of the Rosendale Estates neighborhood. I'd also like to mention the loss of forested land. Land development is a primary driver of deforestation. At the time the comprehensive plan was uh, created, Residential land use in the town comprised 86% of the town, while parks and forested land was only 6% of the land area. I'm sure that's re uh, been reduced since 2003, when the comprehensive plan was created. Uh, with limited space left, with uh, limited open space left within its boundary, the town must carefully consider the impacts of any and all development projects, which can include loss of habitat for resident migratory wildlife, most notably birds, uh, loss of natural heat regulating landscapes, such as forests and increased community heat islands, loss of natural water, man excuse me, water management resources, uh, especially when faced with ever increasing significant precipitation events. Uh, to put in perspective, uh, this approximate 14 acre site is mostly successional forest. Loss of this 14 acres would be equivalent to the loss of 10% of the Reese Nature uh, Sanctuary, or 14% of the Lysha Kill Preserve, 
or 16% of the Mohawk River State Park. Uh, while the tree stock may not hold significant older hardwoods, there are certainly oaks, hickories, and other species that could mature into specimen trees. This won't occur if the site's cleared for development. I also have concerns with site drainage and downstream impacts, particularly uh, water runoff from the additional impervious surfaces um, and the downstream infrastructure that will uh, retain and then uh, transport all of this, which is likely old and inadequate. inadequate excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Mohawk Golf Club is our neighbor. I sincerely appreciate the efforts of Mr. Rutherford to keep the club solvent and maintain it as a valuable recreation and open space asset that it is. Should the planning board uh, discuss this later, I wanted to mention a couple of things that I would respectfully suggest. To ensure that the site design includes the maximum buffer distance and in turn the many, as many trees as possible, as possible between the existing homes on Ruffner and the new properties. To ensure the tree council is engaged to identify any trees that could be included in the site plan and then have those left standing. Uh, to preserve to the greatest extent possible a tree line to maintain the existing aesthetic between the south and west sides of the existing course and the new homes. To consider potential conservation easements on the area, other areas of the Mohawk Golf Club to prevent future subdevelopment. And to seriously evaluate as part of the town code section 18921 requirements for parkland set aside, including any opportunities for passive recreation, open space, bicycle and pedestrian connectivity, and then also decline the fee in lieu of option and or waiver. I appreciate the opportunity to submit these comments to the board and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Valancourt, 1274 Ruffner Road. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition of the proposed development of land uh, at 1851 Union Street. While I respect the property owner's legal right to develop their lands, I pr prefer this development not proceed. I agree with the majority of the comments uh, that have already been outlined before. Um, some of the items uh, I'd like to also reiterate for the board to bring to attention. Um, there's still the outstanding request for an impact assessment to the schools, um, which has not been addressed. I believe that was brought up by both the planning board as well as uh, several community members. Um, before a resolution um, sends this to the town board, I request that this be reconciled so the community and town board um, are able to assess the potential infrastructure and tax burden that the additional homes may cause, uh, especially relating to the school districts, um, you know, new development plans that they're performing, uh, specifically done around uh, prior, you know, assessments for new uh, new families, new dwellings, uh, knowing that this was not on the radar for uh, development and consideration of the number of students they'd be considering. Um, secondly. Uh, infrastructure uh, on the Rougher no Road neighborhood is uh, in question, especially the uh, ability to support 22 additional homes. Uh, many people have brought up the water and sewer <laughs> issue, which will be just uh, identified by a TDE. Uh, it'd be important to have the TDE ensure that they're assessing electrical demands as well. Um, our neighborhood frequently loses power, um, sometimes several times a month. Uh, and that's not always coinciding with a storm. Um, frequently we have uh, transformers that blow because either they're overloaded or there's a mismatch in, in the grid. Um, we are plagued with several issues uh, that National Grid is constantly addressing. Um, in fact, several residents have generators solely because of how inconsistent the reliability of our power grid is. Um, and I understand that this is an item we as residents need to continue to bring up to National Grid, but I wanna make sure that the board is aware of it as well. Um, you know, In fact, when we were checking with National Grid, uh, based on this last outage that we had had for uh, several hours, um, they had noted that they have a flaw in their system and that their system does not actually track 
online issues identified uh, by residents, and they are only actively tracking phone calls uh, for complaints and issues with the grid. Um, the, the, uh, the person on the phone identified that as a current limitation of their capability of the system. Um, so I would, um, I want to highlight this because it would be important for a TDE maybe to uh, perform additional assessments and dig deeper than just any basic data they may be able to gather from National Grid uh, because the data set may be flawed uh, once it's provided by National Grid or any additional assessments. Um, and so that, I think that is an important perspective to keep in the consideration when considering adding an additional uh, 22 modern homes with uh, likely high electricity demand. Um, also, you know, as noted with the, the ecological, you know, impacts of this, um, there is, as many of the residents uh, very near the golf course can, can probably attest to, an extensive coyote pack that lives within the bounds of the golf course. Um, I noted in their uh, documentation, the, the golf course noted that there's no active hunting, trapping, or, or any other um, means of environmental conservation being performed. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there should be or shouldn't be, uh, but it is uh, notable that, um, you know, there's an extensive coyote pack living there. And by deforesting 14 acres, uh, that could pose a significant impact to the residents of the surrounding area, seeing as how that pack would be displaced um, and it would then drive it into the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and then finally, in the packet, construction hours were noted from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., seven days a week, uh, including holidays. I would ask that the board consider prohibiting construction on weekends and holidays. Um, due to the tight residential layout, construction noise would be an undue burden upon community members, especially for the two years that the project is estimated to be uh, in execution. Um, I also would request such prohibition due to large number of young children on the roadway and significant disruption the schedule would cause to the surrounding community. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Louisa Lombardo, 1242 Refner Road. I've spoken here many times. I've submitted letters. I've also submitted photographs of various things. So you know my talk. This last storm, we had two power outages, 12 hours each day. And um, when I think of those grinding pumps without energy or electricity to get rid of that stuff, um, that could be a problem. Also, with all the snow and all the sump pumps now going constantly, and if you go for a walk, I don't know if it's legal or not, but they're pumping their water outside. So there's a need for electricity. We're pumping. I'm, at, I'm on Rector Road. I'm at the top of the hill. And we have water and we're pumping it out. So again, jumping on that, the electrical um, outages and the need for whatever the grinding pump is. Um, and National Grid is on my speed dial because it happens all the time. In going through um, the talk that you gave at the last meeting, going through the comprehensive plan and your comments that you like to have two to connecting roads in and out of places. I feel that, you know, this demolition of 1245 is still not out of the woods. Um, you know, if you can't find two ways in and out of that development. And again, the, the more I look at that picture, that is so ad unnatural. That is not a natural thing. And that little bend in that in the road, is that a calming device or is that to avoid the 11th hole? You know, it's just not a natural way of looking at it. Um, when you talk about noise for the construction, um, the minute it's golfing season, the crack of dawn, and again, I don't live back to back with the golf course. I'm across the street. I hear the leaf blowers, the lawn maintenance, you know, and you remove more of that tree buffer and all those sounds. We hear the fireworks on the 4th of July. That's fun to hear. We hear the bands when there's a party going on. That noise does travel. It does travel. So there will be more noise. And again, if they wanted to preserve the historic character of the golf course, why would they put 
a subdivision there. And if you look, you know, those retention ponds, so is, is that to provide, you know, a buffer so that the golfers don't have to look at the backyards of all these houses? Um, you've heard me talk on and on about the character. Everybody loves our character. Um, the last statement at the last meeting was, the board hopes that whatever does get developed there can contribute to the neighborhood and not be a standalone entity. Uh, you know, I don't see this contributing to our neighborhood in, in any way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Maureen Abrams. I live at 2512 Hilltop Road. So I am here as a resident from that section that borders the golf course. Um, I agree with all of the points that have been made this evening. I totally oppose the development and access roads that are proposed. I believe that it will neg negatively impact the character of Ruffner Road, but as well as my neighborhood on Hilltop Road and all of the uh, streets and neighbors behind me. One major concern that I have living in that section is of noise pollution. When my husband and I first moved to our home, we thought that we were going to be in a quieter residence area than our previous home at 1360 Valencia Road. We were a res we've been residents for over 30 years of Niskuna. We did not take into the account the blatant disregard of the production of noise that the golf club has, has done. They will start their blowers and their, and their leaf blowers more than one at a time, two or three at a time, along with the mower at 6 a.m. sharp every single day of the week. It doesn't matter that we're living residents backing up to this noise. I have complained to them. I have um, complained to the town. I've had the town... Uh, noise inspector go out there and he's and that has been oh it's of it's of normal decibel levels well not when there's two or three mowers going at one time and blowers as well my um concern is that since i live next to a waterway up the pond that is behind uh, my house and on the golf course the water acts as a um amplifier of noise they're proposing a water uh, section on this as well. That amplifies noise naturally. Um, including more residents to this area includes including more noise, it includes more pollution, and includes um, noise that begins so early in the morning as cars leave to, to go to school, work, etc. Um, everyone will be subjected to this noise pollution. The golf club has never changed their ways. You can complain to them over and over again. They are not good neighbors. They are only in their own self-interest and they're golfers who are very few people compared to us as residents, as taxpayers. Could a development of this type be put on another area of the golf course is one of my concerns. There are many paper roads in which such um, areas could be accessed. Would it happen? Could it happen? Are you setting a precedence if you agree to this? Are other areas also endangered of being used and abused? and developed. They've already clear cut about an acre of land that I could see out my kitchen window. Right now, it's a mud puddle. We've had so much water from snow and runoff, and it's on a hill. It's running directly into that waterway, that pond area that is behind my house. Is that um, land already polluting that waterway? How is our wildlife in the, on the golf course going to survive with polluted water? Has the impact of runoff been considered? Has the DEC even looked at this? I have so many questions, but I am totally opposed 
to any of this type of development on such a natural, beautiful property. And I've been very upset that all those trees were cut down. And I did voice that opinion to you back in January. I thank you very much for listening to me this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Wood. Um, I live at 1218 South Country Club Drive. I used to live at 1242 Ruffner Road, and I used to live at 1222 Hedgewood Lane. So I have a history with the golf course. I was a member of the golf course for 50 years, um, but I'm here to speak against this plan. The current dimensions on the road, um, it's 60 feet. I've been back there and measured the space between the green that Mohawk recently extended, which they spent quite a bit of money, extending that green backwards towards Ruffner is only 40 feet. So I don't see how this paper road is gonna make that bend and get into this neighborhood that is a proposed. There's only a 40 foot section there. Um, the, just to touch on a few things, the path for the connection um, that was looked at a long time ago to have one run the entire length of the hole. And that's why the town put the current sidewalk on Rosendale Road. This plan was abandoned due to the fact that uh, people would be injured with golf balls. Um, I live at 1218 South Country Club. We get lots of golf balls. I can tell you that um, it would not be a safe place for a path. You would need that path, uh, that thing to be enclosed in a cage, which they've done at other golf courses. It's not real pretty, um, but it could be done. Um, the trees people have touched on, Mohawk has cut out several pine forests and the coyote population in this forest now is increased due to that fact. We see them, we hear them on a regular basis. Um, I wanted to touch on the fact that um, this property was something that the club had always looked at, considered looking at to sell if they ran into financial difficulties. But the course is privately owned now and Michael Rutherford has done a nice job at maintaining the course. He has spent quite a bit of money on the clubhouse. I see the equipment that goes up and down the um, golf course on a regular basis. There's lots of new equipment. So he spent a lot of money and I'm curious as to now why he's looking to sell this land. Um, it's, it just seems as if it was poorly planned and rushed. I, uh, I'm against it and uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else in this room before we move on to the next room? Come on up, please. Hi, I'm Marlene Lauch. I live at 1191 Ruffner Road, the, where the proposed new road would be going. And I agree with what everybody has said tonight. I love the eloquence and all the information and the technical, everything that's happening on here that's been, been said. Uh, and I've made some notes tonight, hoping that I can be a little more coherent. Uh, obviously, I'm in opposition to this. Um, at the last meeting, after the privilege of the floor, after I had spoken and said that you were making my, my home into a corner lot, um, after privilege was over, I heard someone, I think the chairman say, um, well, she's had two front yards for years. And the truth is, on paper, I have known that that paper road was there. But it's also true that I have lived on a golf course before. I lived on the Alma Down golf course, and that's still thriving, and it's still there. The house is still as it was when we left it in 19, whatever. Um, so, we left that house, moved to Europe and came back. And this is the first house we've owned since we owned that house on the golf course. So when we saw the paper road, 
we had every expectation of thinking it was not going to be developed because that was not vacant land behind us. That was not a farm land behind us. That was already developed land with a fence and a golf course that appeared to be prosperous as the one in San Jose was. So we had every expectation that that was going to stay as it is. So I don't have front two, two front yards. If you walk down the street, you'll see what is a nice sized side yard, which we have maintained for over 40 years. Um, so there's that. There's also the uh, fact that um, when I was a young woman, a much younger woman, I worked for the Bucks County Pennsylvania Planning Commission and not in any planning capacity. Uh, but I was used to hearing people talk about highest and best use of the land. And that mostly means, I think, having to do with the net worth of the land, how to make it the most, the most financially feasible. But I think in this case, the highest and best use of that land is as it is now, as, as a wildlife sanctuary that's just evolved and is there. So I'm, I'm clearly opposed. I, I think that this drawing was done in haste. I don't think all the information is on there that was on the original plan. You don't see the impact of the neighbors, of the driveways, um, and, and of the other things. I, I just think, as someone else said, this is, this is not an inclusive thing. This is, a, this is a strange aberrational subdivision that's just been tacked on with fences around it. So I don't think it's planning to become part of our neighborhood. And I, I truly hope it does not. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shoshana Bule, and I live at 1119 Ruffner Road, and I have spoken to you guys a number of times before. Um, I, too, oppose the development in its entirety. I wanted to make one point that I think was made before that I just want to reiterate, and that is, if you find yourselves in the position of, for whatever reason, having to approve the development in its current location, I suggest that instead of destroying the neighborhood that everyone here has been talking about by having the ingress and egress points be from our road, to consider the many other curb cuts that the, the club already has and the minimal disruption to the club that it would be to expand a cart road to get and connect up with this proposed subdivision. Um, every day I bring my child to Union College to swim and back and I drive by and, and, and recently I've taken to counting the curb cuts as I cut through Mayfair and I look at them all. I look at, I look at South Country Club and then I look at North Country Club and I look at Ball Town and I look at Route 7 and I, I mean, I, I look, I look at, I mean, not Route 7, I look at Ball Town and Union and I think, boy, there are so many ways into this club already. Why do they need to destroy our entire neighborhood? to get into this development when they could just, if they feel that they have to put the development here because it's adjacent to a nice neighborhood and they don't want to put it next to Balltown Road where they have lots of property they could they could convert to houses. If they want to put it near our houses because it makes it nicer. Why can't they put the access road somewhere else? That's, that's the bottom line for me. I, I don't want the development at all, but I understand that if you have to approve the development in its current location, I would suggest that you have them access it from one of their existing curb cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Normandon, 2163 Knott Street. So I'm not even close to this. But um, I will say this. I've heard a couple of concerns. And just to, just to say, you know, I get trying to plan our future. And there are things that we do now that impact our town forever. And things like this disrupt the feel of the neighborhood. And there are ways to develop within a neighborhood that works with it. And it doesn't seem like this is that. And it doesn't seem like, you know, I've got so many conflicting things here. You know, I know that lots of low density housing causes housing crisis. And, you know, we've got a housing crisis in, in the nation, but there's better places for 
developments like this than where it's at. This is not the feel of the neighborhood. Um, things like more natural gas connections. You know, maybe we look at that. Hearing that they want to be able to do construction from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. seven days a week. I've lived near construction before. There is absolutely no peace and quiet. The sound travels. It will, for two years, just... I mean, think about having that right across the street from you. Every day, near your house, for two years... No weekends being able to sleep in. Your kids can't sleep in. Your kids are sick. Oh, well, they're getting woken up. You know, these are these are the impacts that we tend not to really let sink in when we're looking at stuff like this. You know, you're, 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 you're giving no respite to the residents here. If you approve seven day a week construction, they get no time off, no time for their for their mental health to, to regain, no opportunities to just have a weekend off from the noise and everything else that they're having to deal with. So, I mean, even though I don't live near here, um, I would say that if you do have to approve something, why can't it be in the flavor of the neighborhood, right? It doesn't have to be this. If they really want to develop something, it can be something that fits with the neighborhood. But it doesn't seem like they've made that option. They haven't put that effort into it. And if you do have to approve, con approve construction there, Think about what you're doing to the health and well-being of the people that have to live. Make it so that it is something that, you know, isn't going to impact them in the long term. I mean, this is anyway. I mean, you put in a sub-development, you, you can't help that it's going to impact the people around you. But think about what you're doing to their lifestyles and their well-being for the time that that construction is going on. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Amodio. I live at 1382 Rose Hill Boulevard at the very foot of Ruffner Road, where all the water flows right now. Too much of it flows already. I am concerned about more runoff flowing through our property, through our backyard and the field in the back. And I just want to go on record as opposing this development for all the reasons that everyone has already mentioned this here, uh, here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anybody else here in this meeting room that would like to speak before we uh, move? There we go. Good evening, Gio Chapado, 1200 uh, Rothney Road. I live across the uh, street from Josh and uh, Marty. Uh, I was just wondering is <clears throat> if this is a financial issue, I will, and I'm completely against the project. I think the best solution for them would be to be a uh, semi-private golf club. And uh, I think that will solve a lot of their problems. And also there's rumor that the uh, stadium golf club could close. And I believe if it's the case, I think they'd be flourishing. And their business would be way much better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you have anybody out there that wishes to speak out in the um, foyer? No? no? Okay, no one out there? Anybody here before we, go, oh, before we go online? Anybody else out here? Okay. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Mike Mason. I live at 2144 Mountain View Avenue uh, within the 500-foot radius of whatever entrance they want to put in. And I have violently oppose it and I have you know I have so many opposition so much opposition to it that I can't list them all but and I did send a letter to be shared with the board and I can just summarize <clears throat> for one thing I oppose is connecting the Rufter no road neighborhood with the Mohawk Golf Club they're totally different entities they have nothing to do with each other as far as I know and all of a sudden, this huge piece of land wants to chip off a little piece, and they don't even want to support it. They want Ruffner Road to support their dream. 
What do you do with 190 acres? Save it? Uh, there's a proposed walkway. Well, we don't need a walkway between two roads without walkways. And right now there is a walkway. It's a sidewalk on Rosendale Road. And it comes from Country Club Estates right down to Ruffner Road. And then it goes on to Hedgewood and goes on to Rose Hill. Well, that's the end of it. But those roads are all connected now. And that didn't happen but maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And that, that may be the very reason that that was a golf ball hazard. And that's maybe why the road is on Rose Hill. And if I look at that rendering, that's not the right of way. That right of way wasn't put in there to service that land. Where's the rest of it? No, I don't see it. And my experience with right of ways is there's a road and then there's so many feet on either side. Well, look at that right away. There is nothing on one side of it. There's a road, no right away, and all the right away is on the other side. Um, look at the cul de sac. I never saw a cul de sac to look like that. No, I mean, gee, that's an odd looking thing, you know. <laughs> And, 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 and there's all this talk about paper streets. Well, that one's been there for at least 50 years. In, in my mind, there was never any intention to use it. And as time went on, that intention to use it had it, it decrease all the way. And no one stated why that thing is even there. But people don't willy-nilly throw in right-of-ways or paper streets with no intent. So... What's the intent? The, the developer didn't share it with us, that's for sure. And my other, <clears throat> I, you know, I, my other concerns are similar to the concerns you've heard here tonight. So with all due respect, you know, I hope you've heard the concerns and, and I believe that you will factor them in and try to preserve our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the board for listening to all our concerns tonight. My name is Stephen Clemente. I'm speaking for myself and my wife, Kathy, at uh, 1231 Ruffner Road. I've submitted some questions to the board, so I'll try and summarize these uh, quickly in my five minute time span, because I think these questions are important. Uh, you have a copy of this from Laura to actually have the public be informed as to what's happening in the process and, and what's occurring. Uh, we stand in opposition to the development wholeheartedly. Um, and I ask you to respectfully do this either in writing or at one of the future meetings in your findings or however it happens. We don't know if it's even legal for a house in the town of Niski unit to have roadways surrounding it on three sides, the way that it's currently proposed in the current schematic. Um, is that even possible to have your house surrounded on three sides by a road in Niski unit? Secondly, what is the allowable width of the street onto Ruffner Road as proposed for the dead end ingress and egress? Is there a fire code or a town code that requires a certain width? And what is it? And how do you fit it in that roadway? Ruffner Road is only about 25 or 30 feet wide as it is. And I'm interested in what that egress road is going to entail. And so are many of my neighbors. Has an independent review of the long form environmental impact study been submitted, submitted by the developer, been completed, analyzed and reported back? I understand that uh, the engineer, the engineering firm that the town is going to have is going to review that environmental impact, impact uh, form. Uh, if not, when is it expected? Uh, are Weston and Samson Engineering designated to complete that in a certain time frame as part of the process? We're all interested in their analysis, understanding what some of the deficiencies are living right next to the piece of property from a water standpoint, a sewer standpoint, and a groundwater standpoint. Um, has a, a town engineering sewer and water supply been completed to assess the impact on uh, the 22 Housing units being added to the existing sewer system on Ruffner Road and Rosendale Road. This is something that we expect. We expect our board from a due diligence standpoint to do this stuff. This is part of the job. And if, and if it's if it's not contracted, then why isn't it being presented as part of the plan from the Mohawk Golf Club? 
as stated previously, certain segments of the systems are already considered at capacity by the town. We can't go towards River Road because that's at capacity. One of the speakers here last uh, two weeks ago mentioned that specifically. So we're concerned who's going to bear the financial burden uh, of creating the capacity if the capacity doesn't exist for that sewer system or that water system. Is that going to be passed on to the taxpayers in this unit? We want to hear that. We want to hear it from the board on a recommendation. We'd like to know what their thoughts are. These are all details that are extremely critical in the analysis of this, this, this process. Uh, they're technical, yes, but they're critical to us as taxpayers. Have the uh, Town Conservation Advisory Board and the tree committees completed their reviews of the proposed Mohawk Golf Project? When is that review required and who needs to see it? Does it go to the planning board? Does it go to the town board? Where, where do the reports get considered? That's what we're interested in. Those are key components. There's a lot of trees on Ruckner Road, and we'd like to make sure that the ones in that woodlot are preserved, if at all possible. Uh, should the concerns of a privately held commercial golf course, Mohawk Golf Club, outweigh the concerns of the Ruffner Road neighborhood with hundreds of residents paying more in property taxes and school taxes than the Mohawk Golf Club? That's a fact. There's 150 people and more now that have, are interested in stopping this project and if you take a look at the revenue of all those people it drastically dwarfs what what the a private club is currently paying so our concerns continue to be the significant change to the character of the neighborhood which i think is the most important the sewer capacity and the cost issue the water capacity and the cost issue and the safety for all the young families that are moving into our neighborhood and there are lots of them and the pets and the bikers and the walkers and the runners no sidewalks on Ruffner Road or any of the adjoining properties and streets in the neighborhood. And of course, as was eloquently brought up by many people, is the green space and the environmental effect, including all the resident animals in the woodlots as part of the golf course and part of this 14 acres. In conclusion, we urge the board to require an independent analysis of the full environmental impact study long form and to document the deficiencies in the Mohawk Golf Club's proposal as it stands, as many of my neighbors have alluded to tonight. And our sincere thanks for your, uh, for the, to the board for listening to our concerns and giving us kind consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in this room? Hi, I'm Kathy Carlock. I, I live on Story Avenue. So I just wanted to come out and, and um, support the local people on Ruffner Road because I've been on Story Avenue for 25 years and I love where I live. But as well, many of you know that you don't go up and down Story Avenue. <laughs> A lot of people don't. And 25 years ago, the traffic on Story Avenue was not what it is today. Now we have Google Maps and we have tractor trailer trucks coming up Story Avenue. So I'm only telling you, first of all, that we never lose our power. I don't know why. And if we do, it's only for a couple hours. So I'm sorry for all of you on Ruffner Road. But also that to when you're deciding, is this supposed to be coming up for a vote? For Because I only got this this week and I was wondering, do the NISCUNA um, taxpayers, do are we going to vote on this? No. Oh, okay. So I guess what my concern would be is that 25 years from now, what will it be like in that area? And that you might want to just consider, you know, um, where I've been on Story Avenue was a quiet street years ago, 25 years later, we have tractor trailer trucks coming up and we have all kinds of issues. So I just, I'm here to support my neighbors on Ruffner Road and and uh, that's all I have to say. So Thank you, you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, Laura, nobody else here. We can, uh, you have a, <coughs> sure you have a list of the people online. Okay. Oops. So, um, I know he wanted to speak within the first hour, but I, I don't, is Aiden Schweitzer still online? Aiden. Um, Christopher Morris was here. 
Carrie Kirkton. So Terry, what? Carrie Kirkton. I see her on there. If you would like to speak, um, you have to unmute yourself. And also you mentioned Mr. Aid, but he also submitted something in writing too. So we do have his comments also. Um, okay. I'll have to follow up with him, but I don't think I have anything in writing from him. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Kirkton. Oh. I saw you on mute for a second. You had it unmuted if you'd like to speak. Am I unmuted? Yep, you're good now. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak again. Um, I am at 1322 Ruffner Road, and again, just voicing my opposition to this entire project. Um, and again, there were so many people that spoke so eloquently tonight, so I am not going to attempt to reiterate many of those points. Um, again, I would just urge the board to really look at that town plan review it in its entirety, especially those shells and those, the, main, the maintenance of the neighborhood of Ruffner Road and without doing detrimental harm to those around. Um, it just, it strikes me as, and, and everything I've heard tonight, that the desires of so few should not overpower the concerns of so many. There are so many people there, I'm sure, in that room tonight, and I've heard, I've listened to every single one of you speak, and it's been wonderful, and we, we do appreciate the opportunity for us to have our voices heard on this. Um, and to reflect, I would just ask the town board really do some very serious thinking, reflect on these concerns and everything you've heard between safety, traffic, our children. I loved, too, hearing from the younger adults in the room tonight as well, and so so true that i mean this is exactly this is the future of this um this this neighborhood this community and niski Una clearly had a very special place in their heart as well so um i would just ask and urge you to take all of these things into consideration and um again and my my other main point really is the um, environment itself and it always makes me think of a Joni Mitchell song. Uh, sorry to be sort of a, a kind of sappy, <laughs> sappy about it, but it just, I always think of that line that don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And I would just urge you to really think about that as this plan were to develop. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next up, I have Michael Venuti. Michael, if you if you hover your cursor over your screen, the the microphone button should sort of pop up in the middle and you can just click on it, hopefully. It's also you usually at the bottom of the screen, you'll have a row of buttons and one of them will be red with like a kind of microphone with a slash through it and you want to it anymore. Ms. Kirkton, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, alternatively, Michael, you can also use the phone to call in if you would like to speak, and we can wait for you to try that if you want to. Whoops. Um, is William Howe online? Or on the phone. If you um, <clears throat> if you're on the phone, sometimes you have to press star six to unmute yourself. Um, Hi, this is William Howe. Can oh. you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Hi, William Howe. I reside at 1270 Ruffner Road, uh, calling in opposition to the Mohawk Road project. I am a civil engineer with more than 30 years experience, most recently as director of contracts for the New York Department of Transportation. In that time, I have seen hundreds, indeed thousands of projects, bridges, roads, and developments. And in that time, I've learned to identify a good project from a bad project. Uh, my fellow residents and board members, this is a bad project. You don't have to take my word for it. 
Uh, we've all heard about the problems with traffic and safety, with the environment, and with the burden on our town's uh, water, sewer, and power infrastructure. But I would uh, just like to quote uh, one of the town planning uh, members who said, this development appears to have made no consideration for either the adjacent property or the golf course itself. They only tried to put as many buildings as possible in the area which they wanted to develop. This is the essence of bad development. I'd also like to quote the chairman of the planning board who stated that this was the hardest project submitted for approval in his time. Uh, what that means is that this is the worst project that has been submitted for many, many years. In my opinion, approving it would be a tragedy for the town. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Yep, Mr. Venuti, you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Yep, okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Venuti and my wife, Joy Nyman, 1149 Ruffner Road. We are both opposed to the proposal by the Mohawk Golf Club for the residential development as proposed. And, uh, you know, as I look at this currently, it seems that the golf club has been to a degree coexisting, uh, or maybe better said, uh, in balance with the Ruffner Road and the larger community by doing what they do, by providing recreational opportunities and social activities for their members, and more importantly, for us as, as our neighbors, also serving as an open space corridor within our community. Unfortunately, the proposed site plan to create a residential setting within the golf course may create a series of imbalances, especially as it relates to the impacts of the environment, the neighborhood, and ultimately the residents. The impacts on the development uh, they have on the environment you've heard you've heard many times tonight, and I, I won't go into that. But it it is no secret that Niskayuna is truly a gem of the town. Uh, it's comprised of a variety of unique neighborhoods and residents who take pride in living in this community. This sense of uniqueness is real because of the town's ongoing cohesive planning efforts, and obviously thoughtful process that has guided the town to where it is today. The proposal in front of you seems, the proposal in front of you today seems or feels somewhat different. It feels more invasive with multiple structures being proposed within sight of established uh, older residences and access roads proposed between established homes. Imagine what this feels like as a residence and the zone, I'll call it the zone of development, uh, to know that these proposed changes will impact a sense of peace at home, their investment, and the character of the community, which you've heard many times this evening. Simply, this just doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel fair. And I urge you to maintain our unique Niski Una setting our gem of the town by not approving the special use permit uh, for this development. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I had a couple late joiners and I'm not sure if they wanted to speak or not. I know that some people, they joined the Google Meet to watch the meeting. You can actually watch the meeting on YouTube. Um, which is sometimes a nicer way to watch the meeting. But um, Kathleen Lucero, I know you've had some trouble connecting, but I do see you now. Are you interested in speaking under the public hearing? And anybody who's not able to um, comment can always email me, and I'll make sure that the comments are passed on. I also have a Barbara Milano, a Dia Schlossberg, and a Catherine mentor. Okay, so that's my whole list, Chairman. Okay, 
I'll make a last call for anybody online. Anybody wishing to speak? Just unmute yourself and give us give us a try. Go ahead, Juliana. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, they can. Hello, my name is Philip Mentor. I live on 1318 Route Road, and we'd like to say our household is uh, vehemently opposed to uh, this project. Uh, I think we see it as uh, really an abuse uh, to a really beautiful little community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I have two raised hands. Um, Juliana Postgood, would you like to unmute yourself? Go ahead. Am I unmuted? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent. Juliana Postgood, 1169 Highland Park Road. Um, I have written down how many people have spoken tonight. And apart from the opening remarks, um, everyone is in opposition to this, all of us who live in the neighborhood. That is something that should be taken into serious consideration, particularly because with the 30 or so individuals who have spoken, that's representational of all the families that were unable to participate in this meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I also have a raised hand from Rebecca Shirt Shirtliff. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking because I've already submitted some notes, but um, it sounded like the group wanted to hear from some of the younger uh, generation in the neighborhood. And as a 30 year old new homeowner, um, I wanted to share our thoughts as well. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my husband and we live at 1324 Railroad. Um, and we've heard how over the past few months alongside our neighbors, there have been a lot of concerns around the Mohawk Golf Club and this proposed housing development. Um, we want to once again state our direct opposition to this proposal in any and all forms that would impact these surrounding neighborhoods, and in particular, the character, traffic patterns, and infrastructure. The character of the neighborhood is honestly what drew us here. We fell in love with the peace and quiet, the landscape, and how the houses here are affordable, even with the taxes. Um, and really, it has a charm that cannot be replicated in new construction. To us, it really came down to finding a suburban home that didn't look like the cookie cutter developments you see popping up all over the capital region. Um, as someone else stated earlier, the area is truly a gem. And over the past few weeks, listening to these meetings, we've learned that this is really intentional through the top town um, comprehensive plan. We understand that should the development move forward, the construction noise is going to impact our peace and quiet. It's really going to alter the residential landscape with the destruction of green space that so many others have mentioned. Um, and we've also yet to see renderings for the housing that they're intending to build. So there's no guarantee that the charm um, of these homes or that the charm of the surrounding homes can or will be replicated. All of this seems to come in direct opposition to the comprehensive plan. Um, we've also heard concerns around the proposed roadways and the traffic patterns that are going to change because of this. We're also concerned about the heavy equipment that's needed for development and how it's going to lead to quicker destruction of the roadways and increased maintenance, which also disrupts traffic. Um, there's also resulting safety concerns. We previously voiced concern about the safety of people drinking on the golf course and exiting onto new streets into a neighborhood of kids and pets and families. I wanna reiterate this concern after hearing the new information several weeks ago um, when the Mohawk Golf Club openly encouraged drinking uh, through an open bar party that they held to rally their members, many of whom do not reside in this neighborhood in favor of their pro proposal. Um, finally, our primary concern is about the local infrastructure and the toll that the development is going to take on local resources. We've already heard the asks or confirmation or studies on how this development is going to impact the systems and services we have in place. Um, and we also just want to reiterate the same concern for the electrical grid and the flooding issues that we experience in our own backyard. So far, the representatives in the Mohawk Golf Club have not offered concrete answers to these concerns. 
instead stating that there sh they should not be an issue. To me, this phrase should is not reassuring and instead shows a complete lack of planning or foresight into what could become a financial disaster down the road. Um, personally, we believe their dedication to seeing this development through, um, even if it means adding grinder pumps to $750,000 homes, is a little bit admirable and also asinine because I don't know if about anyone else, but if I'm spending over half a million dollars on a home, I don't want to manage the disposal of my own waste. Um, we understand that the property owner has every right to develop their land, but the proposals put forth by the golf club come at a greater expense of neighboring property owners than the club itself. They've made it clear through their statements in public forums that they're unwilling to compromise, despite being made aware that alternate options exist. Um, at 30 years old, we assume we're some of the younger homeowners in the area, um, and we've heard nothing but wonderful things from neighbors who have lived here, many of whom who have been here longer than we've been alive. Um, but it's amazing to see and to hear about the history and to see what can happen in the future. We're really concerned about the next 30 years and the precedent that this development sets for the future of Ruffner Road and the NISC unit community at large. We're concerned that if the current proposals move forward, the board is favoring for-profit development over its own comprehensive plan and the community members that has been elected to serve. I appreciate the due diligence that you're all putting into this and for the consideration of these concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else online? Let's call for online. How about in the room? Give you one more opportunity before we uh, move to uh, at least summarizing the letters and the emails that we've received so far. Anybody else want to speak? Okay. Oh, you can go ahead, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I did receive a lot of letters for the record. I am not, I am not reading them into the record, um, but I am acknowledging, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> acknowledging them, and I will be passing them. Well, I have passed most of them to the planning board and the town board. They'll need some time to read them, um, and um, I did get a couple just right before the meeting, which I'll also include um, probably uh, Wednesday morning. So, letters for the record and support include a letter from Mark. I, at 1134 Millington. Letters uh, for the record against include Beth Chapados, 1200 Ruffner Road, Carol Randalls, Zoe Schlesinger, 1354 Railroad, Alicia Smith, 1161 South Country Drive Club, uh, Craig Lynch, 1249 Hawthorne, Margaret Corey, 2529 Hilltop Road, Joel McDonald, 1317 Ruffner Road, main opposition to access point, um, Hendrick Arnold, 1406 Fox Hollow Road, Rita Fleischman, 1353 Wemple Ave, Susan Mason, 2144 Mountain View Ave, Ruth Gilbert, 2150 Mountain View Ave, George Young, 1241 Ruffner Road, Maureen Warner, Richard Kaler, Michael Mason, 2144 Mountain View Ave, Jane Alun, 2151 Mountain View Ave, Carol Furman, 1269 Ruffner Road, Susan Olsen, Olsen submitted some questions to the board, Christopher Morris, 1917 Mayfair Road, Stephen Clementi, 1231 Ruffner Road, uh, submitted questions for the board, Becky Thomas, 1265 Ruffner Road, Amy Pritchard, 1241 Ruffner Road, uh, Rebecca Shirtliff, 1324 Railroad. Uh, a couple of the new ones I got were from Ursula Hall uh, and Rinaldo Maiorini. Um, and then I wanted to acknowledge a phone call that my department received earlier today from Mary Frances Miller, 1191 Hedgewood Lane, who was opposed. Okay. Thank you, Laura. And uh, they will be attached. You said it wouldn't be part of the record, but it will be part of the record. Anything that was sent will be attached in the minutes? Correct. Yep. I was going to do that for the public hearing, too. Yep. yep for yeah. the public hearing. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right, last call before I close uh, the public hearing. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you for your comments, and thank you for your time. We appreciate it. We do have quite uh, the agenda ahead of us tonight with some working stuff. We will get back to uh, 1851 Union Street, Ruffner Road, later on in the meeting uh, to hear, uh, just to get an update where things stand, and we'll have a board discussion. Obviously, you're welcome to stay, but uh, it'll be on YouTube if you're not able to stay tonight. So thank you, everyone. 
All right, so uh, the public hearing is closed. Next up is privilege of the floor. And we'll give everybody a second to um, move on out. Excuse me. Where is everyone going? Uh, two hours. I said an hour and a half to two. That's some new people. Yep. No. Oh boy. It is the little adjustment. Yeah, you, somebody brought that up. I don't know if it was you, but that was it was in part of our discussions at one time. You know, you know. Usable argument. Okay. Um, we have uh, you know meeting in progress here. Uh, Playwrights of the floor is going to be open next. So anyone wishing to be heard regarding any planning zoning matters in the town of this unit, please come to the microphone, state your name and uh, an address for the record. So privilege of the floor is open. And, and by the way, uh, regarding uh, the, the Mohawk Golf Club, you're welcome to, to repeat your comments. There's, it's not necessary because you know the public hearing, we have captured all those. So if you have any additional information to add that you missed, you're always welcome to speak at privilege of the floor. Hi, my name's uh, Dan Lang. I don't. I live in Rotterdam. But yeah, I'm one of the you better hold up till they close the door so we can make sure we get you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Not in me. That's okay. Then. Could you? Could you yeah. So let me close the door. Thank you very much, Trish. Uh, my name's Dan Lang. I'm one of the owners of Lang's Pharmacy. Uh, we also own the building that the Broken Inn is in. I know that they're, they have a proposal uh, coming up for you guys for the their outdoor area. Um, my concern right now is the, pave, the striping of the parking lot. I understand the town wants to do something at the corner, at some the corner of Crescent Road and Clifton Park and that whole mess, but without striping it the way it is now, just an open black top, do whatever you want area. You've already lowered our parking by eliminating our parking lot that was across the street. And now it, without striping it, if a car parks four or five feet away from another car and that happens all the way down the parking lot, that parking lot's capacity has been cut in half. Now, I personally have been striping the parking lot for 25 years, and I've done it with a can and a, a, a walker with a wheel and a tape measure, and it would take me an hour on a Sunday morning. I don't understand the delay in striping it. When they paved it last year, I made the point that, you know, we need to stripe it because winter's coming, and Winter came and it was not striped. Well, spring's here and the parking lot's open again and it's still not striped. And I understand there's some opposition to actually striping it. And I want to ask the board, please, if you guys don't want to do it, you expect me to plow it and maintain it, then let me stripe it irregardless of what happens with Mr. Nicky and the broken in the parking lot there just for the safety of the people there eight years ago we started meetings about changing the whole parking lot structure the first thing I said was we need to clearly delineate where you drive where you park and where you walk and while that's been accomplished to a degree in the front the back is suffering from the exact same thing. <laughs> There's no clear place of where you park or where you walk, you know, and without it, it's, it's suffering not only my business, not only Mr. Nicky's business, but the co-op today had the front parking lot dug up because they were fixing the manhole cover that they covered. 
Well, where do you think all those people parked? They parked down by us and walked up. Plus all the people in the neighborhood that park there and walk up. It needs, something needs to be done. We can't wait forever. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, privilege of the floor. Anybody else? Richard Norman, 2163 Knott Street. I basically live across from the Broken Inn. Um, I also own the property directly across from the Broken Inn. So um, I guess I'll start off when, you know, he first came around signing the petition. I was, I was more than happy to sign. You know, I like the idea of having space. I got to say, he's great at what he does. Uh, he's done a lot to, you know, support the community. He's got thing. There's been a lot of really positive things that, that he has done. And I've pretty much supported him since day one on that. I even let him use some of my uh, empty dumpster space when he was doing his renovations. You know, I believe in being neighborly and all that. Um, I will say that I definitely do have some concerns around the proposal. If it's really just going to be seating for people eating ice cream, I get it. That's great. It's an idyllic scene. Very Norman rockwell as you know. Families gather around a table eating ice cream and it's drips in the summer heat. I get it. I'm all for that kind of thing. My concern comes from what else? All right. I mean, by my best estimation, it's probably done about a million dollars worth of business already. And that was even with the construction and everything. I, my concern is what else? Right. You know, six tables. That's at a bare minimum, you know, four to eight people. He's saying per, per table. That's somewhere between 24 and 48 extra people. Four extra parking spots being eaten up by 24 to 48 extra people. That's actually a net loss. I'm all for a table or two. Benches, something for families. My concern comes from the what else. You know, what else does this do to, to the value or and the feel of our neighborhood? Are there going to be people who are gathering outside with their drinks because it's hot inside, so they want to be outside and they're you know, having their drinks and they're making noise or they, somebody wants to smoke. So, you know, the crowd goes outside. Well, who's monitoring that? Who's monitoring that for noise? No table service. Well, that doesn't say anything about somebody can't order a meal or drinks inside and carry it out. Right. And again, I'm, I'm all for the positive impact that the place has already had on, on the, on the neighborhood. I'm not going to try and say that it hasn't. I'm, I'm all for it. I go there for myself for dinners and, I brought my kids there. You know, they love the ice cream. We go sit down. They love the chicken tenders. I get it. It's, it's a great place. But my concern is, you know, I've gone down there because on game nights, they had the door propped open because it was hot inside. And the cheers of the crowd are coming down and keeping my kids with me. And that's two houses down. Never mind the people that are living right across from me. You know, what about... You know, if, if you have an outdoor space, what's the capacity for it? How many people do you allow out there? Do you allow alcoholic drinks out there? Like, what are the rules for this space going to be? You know, we already have problems now with Crescent Street with all the, the flow, overflow parking. Crescent Street is basically turned into a one-lane street at times because you got people parking on both sides of the street. you got the apartment complex on the one side, and you've got people for the restaurant on the other. And you'll see that, you know, certain times of night, you can't you can't have the cars going in opposite directions on, on Crescent Street. So um, you know I've seen trucks that used to back up to do deliveries are now parking you know on Clifton Park Road as well. Um, so I get it, but my concern is the what else? You know, it's this now. What is it in here? What is it in two? There's been times where the broken in spent a few rules. I get it. We want to celebrate the New Skinner High School football team. Great, but he kept the business open after the agreed upon hours. New Year's Eve, open past hours. Certain sports team days, open past hours. You know, I get that there's a certain thing about doing it for the community and, and supporting the community and things like that, but my concern is the what else and who's responsible for it and who has to monitor it, you know. If there's no table service out there, is an employee going to be out there monitoring how things are going? If People are out there with their drinks and whatever else. No, there's, there's not. So, um, I 
like I said, you know, I, I, I get it. Um, there are certain aspects of it that I'm, I'm absolutely all for. You know, again, if it's, if it's for, for people with ice cream and that's the limit of it, we're like, all right, no alcoholic drinks outside, you know, none of this, none of that. That's great. I just want to make sure that we consider the impact. Um, much like the noise with the, the golf course, there's nothing but hard edged buildings there with lots of brick and everything else. The noise, reverberates, there's no way to absorb that noise. A couple of planters are not going to do it. Um, so, you know, I just like you to, to think about how you would feel living across from that, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. What you, if you live there, what you would want to set the parameters for that space to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else for privilege of the floor? Last call. All right. Thank you for your comments. And we'll close privilege of the floor and we'll move on the agenda. <clears throat> we have no unfinished business tonight, but we do have uh, several res resolutions under new business. Uh, first resolution being resolution 202309, amendment to resolution 202306. This is for a sketch plan approval for a subdivision, uh, Antonio Park, Pulsinelli Drive. Uh, resolutions, all resolutions are posted. I am going to summarize some key points of the resolutions um, for the record. So in this resolution, I'm just going to, it's pretty straightforward. Further resolve that this planning board does hereby call for a public hearing to be held Monday, April 17th, 2023 at 7 p.m. in this unit town hall, one this unit circle, to consider the application of Fred Pulsinelli for a two-lot minor subdivision, including a lot line adjustment for Homestead Place at Antonio Park, a tax, tax map parcel 40.1-54-11. And that's it. So I have a motion for approval of the resolution. I so move. Uh, moved by Ms. Gold for adoption. Do I have a second? Second. And seconded by Mr. Khan. Mr. Henry, would you please call the roll? Well, sorry. Is there any discussion? Uh, the only thing I guess I'd like to add is that uh, we previously called for a public hearing. We weren't able to pull it off. So basically, this resolution uh, recalls for that same public hearing. So uh, my uh, understanding is it's basically the same resolution except for a date change. And we will have a short discussion under uh, later on regarding this subject. Okay. Any other comments or concerns regarding the resolution? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Henry, would you please call the roll? Mr. LaFlam. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. McPartland. Aye. Arpino. Aye. Ms. Gold. Aye. Ms. Strang. Aye. Chairman Walsh. Aye. Motion carries the resolution is approved. Thank you. And we'll talk about that again in a little while. Uh, second uh, resolution time is resolution 2023-10, a resolution for site plan approval for a new facade and ATM signage at the Chase Bank located at 2321 Knott Street East. That's in the ShopRite Plaza. Uh, on this one here, and again, uh, it's been uploaded. Uh, resolve the Plain Board and Zoning Commission has determined that the proposed sign waivers as described above, with, above would have a minimum negative effect on the aesthetics. Those waivers include uh, for the colors, for the uh, uh, ATM mounted to the, to the face of the building, uh, and uh, the ATM incorporates a sign and colors, uh, and the colors aren't usually uh, allowed in the town center overlay district, but uh, we're gonna, uh, if this is approved, we're gonna grant those waivers. Further resolve that Planning Board and Zoning Commission does hereby grant said waivers to allow for the signage as described in a seven page document entitled Niskin North by Philadelphia Signs Stamp 31523-23, and be it further resolved that this planning board and zoning commission finds the above reference site plan meets the requirement of the zoning code and previous site plans approval, and therefore hereby approves the site plan. Uh, no project leads, so I'll make a motion that we approve the signage and the waivers. Second. Okay. Second by Ms. Gold. Any discussion? Yeah, pretty straightforward here. Uh, we talked about this at our last meeting. The board was comfortable uh, with the uh, submittal by the applicant. Uh, and. Uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, obviously, uh, if this is approved, uh, we welcome uh, Chase Bank uh, uh, being uh, coming to the ShopRite Plaza. So thank you. Any other comments at all? Mr. Henry, please call the roll. Mr. LaFlam. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. McPartland. Aye. Mr. Dorpino. Aye. Ms. Gold. Aye. Ms. Strang. Aye. Chairman Walsh. Aye. Uh, resolution's approved. And again, uh, welcome to the community and uh, look forward to you being there. All right. Next resolution. I don't know. Do we have anybody online from Chase Bank? 
No, okay. All right, uh, next resolution, I'm losing it here. Uh, okay, resolution 2023-11, uh, a resolution for site plan approval for a tenant change in Northeast underlayments under pre-existing non-conforming interior storage use at 31 East Street. And I think I, I lost that one somehow. Yeah, here it is. I'm old fashioned, I, I gotta have paper, sorry. The Chair Moss, I'll be recusing myself from this one. Okay, thank you. And uh, and Ms. Strang will be sitting in, oh, is she, you're already sitting in for Mr. Scrappy Tennis, so Mr. Drescher will uh, will take your seat on this one. All right, thank you, Mr. DiArpino. Resolved the Plain Board and Zoning Commission acting in accordance with the state environmental quality review reg regulations and local law has determined that this project will not have a significant effect on the environment and hereby directs the town planner to file a negative declaration. And be it resolved, the Planning Board and Zoning Commission finds the above, above reference site plan meets the requirements of zoning code and previous site plan approvals, and therefore hereby approves this site plan with the following conditions. One, the property is to be used for interior storage only, no outdoor storage is allowed. Two, the proposed office area must be incidental to the interior storage and shall not exceed 320 square feet, including the 336 square foot bathroom. Three, all vehicles and trailers parked on site are to be licensed and operational. No storage of inoperable vehicles is allowed. Four, a thick vegetative buffer or privacy fence is required to be maintained on the property owner in perpetuity to adequately screen the adjacent residents from high lights and noise associated with the parking spots between the front of the building and East Street. Five, prior to issuance of the building commit, the NISC unit architectural board shall review and approve any architectural design features to the site that help it blend in with the surrounding rural residential neighborhood. Six, the landscaping notes in the above reference site plan do not create an adequate buffer as recommended by the Zoning Board of Appeals and Conservation Advisory Council. And therefore the applicant will work on a final landscaping plan approved by the tree council that shall supersede the landscaping notes provided. Prior to issuance of a final certificate of occupancy for the building, the NISC unit tree council shall review, review and approve the final landscaping plan, including species type and final locations, including the parking lot buffer or fence and the vegetative buffers to be to the surrounding residences, Mohawk, Hudson bike trail also. Prior to issuance of a building permit, this is condition seven, all site grading and engineering shall be addressed to the satisfaction of the town engineering department. Uh, Mr. Laflamme, do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Mr. Flam. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Strang, and we'll have some discussion. Uh, do we have the applicant online for this one? Okay, I know she was online earlier. We've yeah, I think I see her. Yeah, um, is it is it Conus? Yeah, Ms. Yeah, Miss Conus. Sometimes you have to press star six to unmute yourself. She's on the phone. Yeah, she calls in on the phone. Yeah, star six. Actually, I don't think. Yeah, the, the only thing I want to ask, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, she had an opportunity to read the conditions and where she had any concerns with any of them. I did call her and spoke to her about. A especially the landscaping one. So she's aware of that. She was amenable to that. Originally, her engineer had submitted a plan to us with a significant buffer. Um, the cost of that was prohibitive. Um, and then they came back with a much reduced buffer. And I think it, it's got to be somewhere in between. She was amenable to that. Um, the parking spaces that we called out in the um, resolution, I also talked to her about. So I think there's probably always been parking in front of the building, but it's never been striped and it's now facing the um, homes. And so like typical to River's Ledge or whatever, we would require that those headlights can't shine into those residential homes, especially if her, I mean, I think she discussed hours of operation more with the zoning board probably than you guys, but I think a couple of times she said like 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> so that's pretty early. And at least for me. And um she was even amenable to swapping those parking spaces so that they face um, uh, the Mohawk Hudson bike hike. Yeah, trail. face the other direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I obviously encourage anything we can do to, uh, to minimize the cost of the applicant, especially uh, with the hours of operation being mostly during the daytime. Of course, during the winter, you know, it gets dark early and it may impact the neighbors, but um, um, just we just need to have a, a balance of that. So if they can rotate the parking spots to... Uh, uh, minimize the amount of uh, privacy fence or shrubbery uh, to be able to satisfy that requirement. You know, I'd be all for that. So, we okay. discussed a berm in front. Was that ever brought up again, or was that the expensive option? 
I didn't see a berm on there. No, it wasn't on there. It was just a consideration. Yeah. In the landscaping, yeah. I yeah. didn't discuss that specifically with her. I do feel like sort of headlights going onto the bike path at 6.30 in the morning is not a particularly big deal if they were to switch them. Yep. If anything, it might discourage inappropriate activities. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably okay <laughs> for it, the headlights. Like biking at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> but... I mean, some people like to back into the spot. So if you flip them and then they're still backing in, it's probably really important if they're going to be parking anywhere kind of between the building and the, that you do a pretty thick screen for the residents. Yeah, well, the, res the resolution indicates. That yeah, the yeah, that's needs in there multiple there, times. So yep. If it doesn't just, serve the purpose, it's got to be redone. I went through the conditions with her and she just said, I understand what you're saying about the parking spaces and I might be able to move them. Right. Yeah. And if we can move them, that would be a, a big good solution. Probably cost effective for the applicant also. All right. The only other comment I have, and, I, and I'm okay with the, the resolution, but I just want to make a point. Uh, we had a discussion a couple of meetings ago regarding, I, I was going to throw out a percentage yep. of how uh, how much of the uh, uh, interior storage could be modified. I think the application said like 15, I calculate 17, and I was corrected, I believe, by the town attorney that uh, incidental was on the order of 10% uh, is what I was told. But in reality, the uh, 320 square foot is much greater than the 10% of what's in there. Now, again, I supported the uh, uh, the area variances, so I'm okay with it. But I just want to make a point that uh, we need to be careful on what's incidental if 10% is a true rule of thumb, all right? Um, uh, this is very clear that it's 320 square feet total, including the 36 square foot um, bathroom, all right? Uh, and I just suggest that if, if, if it ever changes hands, you know, this uh, uh, property property okay i'll be right with you hang on if he ever changes hands uh, that we may or make sure we pull up this resolution it's important and we kept we have to keep it at 320 square feet or less all right laura can you hear me yep we can hear you oh my god we got gotcha. you <laughs> i've been pounding this phone <laughs> <laughs> so my question sorry to, about that no problem uh, welcome i'm glad you're on online the question was, did you have an opportunity to read the conditions? Did you have any concerns or anything you want to discuss uh, before we take action on this? No, I did read um, what you had said, and I had talked to Laura, as Laura was saying to you. Um, as far as the headlights and stuff go, um, I was going to talk to them because I'm not sure how many bushes it would take. Um, we were looking at between junipers and boxwood, so it would stay something green so that even in the winter, nothing would fall off and there would still be a coverage for headlights or taillights. And then we were looking at, where's my list here? I threw all the papers when I couldn't get the phone done. Mute. <laughs> and then we were looking at um, uh, the, the catmint, the ferns, the butterfly bushes, the bee balm, all of the natural and the spireas going down the side of the building. And then she said, I didn't have to get the big ones to put towards the bike path. So then we were looking at the Norway spruces and the white spruces and the can of ferns that the deer wouldn't eat. So they would stay green and crump, go up over the bike path. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if you heard what I said, but I was, I was encouraging the uh, planning department to, uh, you know, try to work with you to, to minimize a yeah. uh, uh, bare minimum that meets uh, the desires, uh, uh, but it's reasonable. And yet there was a mention that you might rotate some of the parking spots to uh, uh, point the headlights elsewhere. And that would help maybe minimize uh, the expense of uh, trying to build a buffer uh, in some in some regards. So something also to right. consider. Okay. Anything else for, from Ms. Konas? No, no, I'm good. No, did you close on the building yet? No, waiting for the date now. <laughs> okay, good for you. We'll, we'll get there. We'll also get there. Any other comments from the board? No. No? Yeah, Chairman, I did notice the 10%. Actually, when we were, it was originally written into the resolution, and when I realized it wasn't 10%, yeah. it went with the square footage that was um, sort of talked about at the zoning board, although I think the zoning board's understanding was that 320 was 10%, but I don't think that they ever – actually put 10% anywhere. So I stuck with the 320. Yeah, I understand. I just want yeah. to make the point yeah. for future that we, you know, if it's 10% is considered incidental, 10% or less, we need to, that was the to hold that standard because that that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, uh, 
yet a building is uh, 2291, uh, 2300 square feet, that would actually make it 230 square feet, that would be 10%. So, so 320, you get some extra space there. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> any, any other comments? None. All right, All right. Mr. Henry, please call the roll. Mr. LaFlam. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. McPartland. Aye. Ms. Gold. Aye. Ms. Strang. Aye. Mr. Drescher. Aye. Chairman Walsh. Aye. And that was an aye for Mr. Drescher in case the microphone was not okay. All right. Uh, uh, motion carries, resolutions approved. Uh, congratulations uh, and thank you for your hard work on this site to uh, to uh, try to improve it. We appreciate that. No, I appreciate all your help. Okay, good luck. All right. Thank you. All right, and let's see. That takes care of that one. Next up, we have a resolution for site plan approval for seasonal public outdoor picnic table area on the property at 2209 Knott Street, and that's the broken in. I'm going to summarize again. Resolved, this planning board and zoning commission does hereby grant final site plan approval for a seasonal public outdoor picnic table area in the property of 2209 Knott Street, which requires a reconfiguration of parking in the right of way subject to the following conditions. One, a building permit is required for the addition of the public outdoor seating. Two, the public seating table shall be affixed to the pavement in a manner approved by the building inspector. Three, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall to participate in an on-site meeting with the town of Niskuna and shall address any concerns raised by the town for this resolution, maintenance of the public outdoor seating. By this resolution, maintenance of the public outdoor seating is the sole responsibility of the applicant. Five, by this resolution, the existing temporary white and yellow water-filled traffic barriers are proposed to be covered, uh, converted into permanent traffic barriers covered with planter boxes as shown in the applicant's site renderings, which harmonize with the surrounding neighborhood and complement the town center overlay district. Maintenance of the traffic barrier planter boxes is sole responsibility of the applicant. Six, by, the res by this resolution, the parking lot reconfiguration and striping shall be undertaken by the town of Niskayuna in conjunction with in agreement with Schenectady County for their portions on the Knott Street right of way. And seven, per resolution 2021-2, condition number six, because the proposed business hours are complementary to many of the existing uses ide as identified in the planning board's parking analysis. Any increases to the hours out, outlined below would require further planning board review and approval. So the uh, the hours are Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday, 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. Fridays from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Saturdays from 9 to 11, and Sundays from 9 to 10. No changes to the business hours outlined above are proposed by the applicant. Uh, do, Mr. Uh, Diarpino, do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, motion is for approval of the resolution. Can I have a second? A second. And we have the applicant present. Thank you, Mr. Nicky. And, and we're on these conditions, I believe. Correct. Um, to the conditions, I do respectfully request that we uh, modify or eliminate two of them. I'd like some clarification on the third one. My first uh, concern is that uh, condition two, the public seating tables shall be affixed to the pavement in a manner approved by the building inspector. Uh, first and foremost, this was not anything that's ever come up in any meeting that we've had so far. We've had discussion now for the better part of 11 months. This was an 11th hour addition that we uh, were given, but that does not uh, benefit anyone in terms of safety. So whether it's our ability to move those tables in an emergent condition, or whether it's just a matter of us being able to move those tables uh, in terms of our ability to uh, power wash and clean, uh, or someone who bumps into a table and a table having some give. Uh, this is not something that we see any upside to. Excuse me. In addition, as it's listed in the notes for this evening, it says the planning department has reached out to Fire District 1 for their thoughts on this and recommends the least restrictive method for anchoring. I would contend that the least restrictive method for anchoring is not anchoring. The only thing I would say to that is if there's concerns about these tables easily being moved, we will have umbrellas. Those umbrellas are weighted down uh, by the base of the umbrella, and that in and of itself provides some extra, uh, let's call it support, for people not moving those tables. The last thing I'll submit is that at some point in this process, which I've mentioned in email, uh, you're going to have to trust us to do things the right way. 
So if a table is moved, we'll immediately move it back, or at the end of that evening, move it back. But our intention now, after meeting after meeting, 300 some odd days here, is not to dupe the town of Miskiuna by placing picnic tables and then moving them onto your property. So I would ask you to strike that from this resolution. Okay. How, about, how about you go through the rest of the conditions, concerns, and we'll, we'll yes, address sir. them all at once. Number two, the uh, next thing that I would ask we strike uh, is condition um, uh, number six. Here. Condition six. By this resolution, the parking lot reconfiguration and striping shall be undertaken by the town of Niskayuna in, con in conjunction with an agreement with, the Schenec with Schenectady County for their portions of the Knott Street right of way, ROW. Um, First and foremost is safety. At this point in time, as Mr. Lang stated when he came up here during privilege of the floor, this parking lot is less safe unstriped than it is striped. Number one, uh, he's been doing it for 25 years. He's been asked to do it, I believe, by the town. A portion of it lay on his property. Um, it maximizes parking. We had another gentleman here for privilege of the floor talk about people parking on the street and Crescent Road and things of that sort. Uh, this helps to alleviate that. Um, I've submitted a letter, which I don't know if hopefully it was distributed, signed uh, and requesting that we that this board allow the broken in myself uh, to strike this uh, now and not to delay. Um, this is unanimous. This is the Niskuna Co-op. This is Niskuna Wine and Liquors. This is Mustachios. This is Niskuna uh, Office uh, Shipping Store. This is John's hairstyles. This is Marie's alteration. This is Lang's pharmacy, and this is the broker. And this is every single tenant in this plaza asking the planning board in writing and dated today and addressed to you today to allow us to put paint on the sidewalk. And as you remember from previous, I'm sorry, on the, on the street. And as you remember from previous meetings, the only reason we were told not to strike was out of concern for our expense of doing so. Uh, the last thing I'll say to that is in our original special use permit, one of the stipulations was that we were to strike this parking lot. I can't understand for the life of me, and I'm hoping that it stops tonight, why the goal line is being moved, where we're told to strike. And then we're told to get a plan and a design from NJ Engineering, which we pay for, and that when that comes back, we have discussion after discussion with you. And then here we are again at the 11th hour, told not to strike which again goes to safety, to maximizing parking. So I'd ask that you strike that from this. And then the only other thing I'd ask for is clarification in terms of when the building permit is to be issued. Because at this point in time, we're talking about putting picnic tables on concrete outside. We'll be at April 1st by this Saturday. And it seems as if the issuance of a building permit at this point in time is at the discretion of the planning and building department. And I'd like to get some clarification mm -hmm. as to when that'll be issued and what's needed to issue that because we've spent enough time on this. And if they want to drag their feet, they can do so. Okay. That's uh, condition number three. I believe you're referring to the concern about having a, uh, uh, a, a like a pre-construction meeting in order to get the, the uh, building permit. Correct. And I would say in terms of what needs to be accomplished at that meeting, we've already presented the layout. We've uh, got, community support, we've got landlord support, we need code, we're paying for it ourselves. Uh, I would tell you, it's listed here in the notes from the March 28th meeting that the building inspector, quote, the building inspector took a cursory review of the drawing. Uh, I think if anyone knows what the definition of cursory means, you'll understand that that's uh, almost akin to not looking at all. That's hasty uh, if they wanna come and do that. Ample time has been supplied to do so. But at this point in time, uh, we'd ask that a building permit be issued tomorrow. All right. Well, you have to apply for it, and it has to go through the process of the building permit process. But um, so, I'd, can, I'd like to, I'm sorry, for clarification, what exactly is needed in that process to issue a building? Permit? Well, I mean, you have to fill out the paperwork, right? And it goes and it gets approved by the building inspector, right? And and then you, it gets anything issued. That would, anything that would prevent the building permit from being issued? Um, well, well, it gets in a queue, so I, I don't. You you're asking to jump the line to put picnic tables on the street after we've gone through this for a long You know, it's a, it's a process that encompasses a lot of different app permit applications. Okay. So, 
Yeah, I mean, with the permit. It's not under our purview. Yeah, and and you know, everybody else needs a building permit too. So we'll, we'll work on that. I think the concern when I, I spoke to you was regarding condition three about having a meeting in order to get the building permit. And I and I, I, I thought that condition number three is pretty much a, it's a standard condition. Standard. So my question, my question is, does it need to be, do we need to have the standard uh, condition that we would have for a much more complicated project when we're just, you know, not just, but looking for a building permit for the picnic tables and for the, the you know, the stuff that we've been working on. I, yeah, I actually took out most of the standard conditions because it is such a simple project. I did leave this one because um, I recommend doing it, um, especially because the town does need to do the striping. Um, just, I mean, Elena can chime in here, but the but if the town has decided that they want to stripe their own right of way, I, the planning board doesn't have the authority to um, change that. Yeah, um, I, was, I was talking about the meeting. You know, if yeah, you but, we have to have a meeting. Right, I know. But I'm just saying that I think it's important. Like, you guys do the review. You get the planning process done. It goes to building permit. But I think it's really useful to have the highway superintendent and the engineer there to meet with you so that you can be like, here's where I'm placing the barriers, here's where the striping's going. And just so everyone's all on the same page as the work is being completed. It's a standard condition, but I also think it's really important that, you know, like the, the bigger players that are involved in this like joint effort are all meeting before anybody actually like not puts a shovel in the ground in this particular instance, in, instance but starts spending money on the, you know, the planters and the picnic tables and things like that, I think it's really important that everybody is standing out there together and agreeing on timelines and paintings and things like I, that. I have always made myself available immediately. I would like to hopefully have this meeting as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've had challenges with communication, mm -hmm. so I'd like to make sure that okay. uh, we do this quickly. I would also ask, if, as you just mentioned, um, and, and you referenced uh, Elena, if the town has required Mr. Lang to strike this parking lot, for the last 25 years himself and he's done this himself for the last 25 years and a portion of this is on his property why is he not able to strike to his own parking lot at this point in time because as previously discussed in several other meetings the town is looking at that intersection as a whole and what we're looking to do as far as pocket park potentially and everything so prior to any finality being done right. instead of putting you on the hook for it the town has said we will do that in conjunction with the entire project for that particular intersection. Okay, do we have a timeline? Because I spoke to Jamie LaHuff from Metroplex today, and he said the discussions, quote, are in very early stages and that they don't anticipate anything happening anytime soon there. I have not been privy to that, so I can't answer that. Yeah, is that the reference to a long-term project or to this project? To anything going on at that point, yeah. at, at, at that, that well, I hope I hope that's not the case, because we're really just talking about, you know, the striping and working with the county. Yeah, well, to, no, yeah. No. to be clear, we're talking about temporary striping on this project. The town will do the temporary striping as soon as it's available, for as soon as the weather is good enough for them to do the temporary striping. Um, but the longer term project, I think is still in the early stages. Laura um, or Elena, I, I would, would, would the town have any objection to a modification of condition number six to just add language that states at the sole discretion of the town the applicant may stripe. I believe everyone's asking for that. Well, I'm asking if the town attorney and Laura, if you're okay with the town being able to delegate that responsibility as it sees fit. That's interesting. I mean, I leave that up to Elena, but I have been working. I've been meeting with the highway department. I've had communications with the Schenectady County. Um, I know Mr. Nicky generously agreed to remove the cribbing, but that's not something the county is like, has to enter an agreement with the town. We have to show what the finished project's gonna be after the curbing is removed. Um, there's a lot that goes into, I mean, the county's willing to draft an agreement for us to change the parking and put it in there, but it's not, it's not something that, that I think the town can delegate. I mean, because there's agreements and things that have to go into it, and we know that the lines are going to change. I don't think that the position of the town is, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend putting it in there because right. I've been working really hard on it. I think that the highway department is ready to meet with Mr. Nicky. I think Ray, even this morning, said, I mean, the weather's got to get 
better, but his, you know, he understands to get his crew out there when he can. Um, but even like trying to decide when to do the striping and when to remove the curb, like it, um, I just. Right. But you said that they would, they would do temporary striping until, and then when the curb is removed, it'll be restriped. Is that what I heard? Well, my understanding of what's happening right now is that, and I tried to, you know, outline, Mr. Nicky can put, per this resolution, if it passes, could apply for a building permit as long as all the codes are met with the separation of the tables and everything. Permit could be issued, meet with the town, figure out where the planters are going and where the parking spaces are going, and we'd stripe them temporarily, and the town will work with the county on yeah. removing the curb. And then in the future, we may change quite a bit that's happening around the Crescent uh, Clifton Park alleyway intersection. I understand, Laura, but unfortunately, condition three says prior to the issuance of the building permit, you would have that meeting. You just said after the issuance of the building permit. Yeah, I mean, I would do yeah. it, like Mr. Nicky said, as soon as possible. Our yeah. um, standard conditions usually say prior to issuance of the building permit. Okay, so, I, you know, I just, and Laura knows, I've talked to Laura about this last week. So, bottom line is, you know, I know there's a sense of urgency. Uh, town will do its best uh, to, to uh, get this meeting right away and get your building permit once this resolution goes somewhere right tonight and uh, uh, and that's like I said I can understand that the, the the point of the town from the striping they want to stripe it okay uh, if there's concerns about working with the county and any agreements the town's got to do that so like all, all I can ask and, I, and and then Laura knows this is that try to move it along as quickly as possible right so I don't have and, and no disrespect but Tell a lot of faith in that. I would ask the question: Why is it that since we first applied in October of 2020, that this lot has not been striped? Well, and, and well, things have changed, and there was discussions, as uh, the even, town attorney said. So that even when it was paved, yeah, well, it wasn't striped. Why is why is it now going to be striped? I mean, partly that's because it's been in flux for such a long time. Your applications have changed. The town has reviewed every application that you submitted, provided comments to you on them, but. Some of the applications that were submitted were not approvable. Um, I think at sometimes the town had said, we know we're gonna do changes. I don't think we should stripe. I feel like we did have some good communication that striping is beneficial to the neighbors and it's beneficial for safety. So I went back and we're like, okay, we'll stripe this as long as everybody understands that it's temporary. But the thing I think that does put a kink in it, which you brought up is that if you reconfigure those four parking spaces, you do have to remove that curb. I, I'm not even sure you can actually necessarily stripe those last two um, without removing that curb because the curb. Well, as Mr. Darpino suggested in an earlier meeting, to utilize and stripe the rest of the area and just not utilize two parking spaces there and use the existing barricade is something that at least temporarily, I think we can all agree temporarily striping is better than not striping at all. Yeah, I think we are all agreeing to that. allows us to get there. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking is, May I temporarily strike? And when the town decides that they're ready to configure or make changes as they want to or strike as they want to, to undo what I've done or I'll pay to undo by painting over those lines in black to strike that way. So we have something tomorrow so that we have 12 or 14 parking spaces instead of seven or eight with people walking through there. I have had repeated meetings with um, town supervisor and the highway superintendent. They are committed to striping this as soon as the weather allows, um, but it is their intention to stripe it. The town is, is the town's intention to stripe these parking spaces. Okay, we're clear. Okay, so it sounds like unless somebody makes a motion to change condition three or six, it's gonna be uh, the resolution that stands for those two conditions right now, all right? Yeah. Well, um, we didn't really discuss um, condition number two. And, and that's where it's going next. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so well, I, I make a motion to modify condition number six or strike it. If it's, as it's already, if it's true, as it's already been stated that this board does not have the authority to tell the town of Niskayuna whether or not to reconfigure and stripe, then I don't see how we can condition the approval of the site plan on that. And personally, from what I've heard thus far, I do share some of the concerns raised about the safety of patrons to this business and the other businesses in the plaza. And I think it's notable that all the businesses have come together to voice that same concern. Um, so I think we have to take I any step possible to make this a little more expedient, if only just to leave the door open to the applicants striping it. Um, if the town 
decides that um, they're okay with the applicant striping it after every 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 other approval has been granted. Um, I'm I'm simply saying you would you would save this business the few days between the meeting which occurs with highway and the the day on which the highway department is available to bring their striping equipment to the site and stripe. I don't know that I'm necessarily following you because all the, my understanding is all the condition is doing is stating that the town will be undertaking the striping, not that it impacts the timeline of anything as far as Mr. Nietzsche's approvals. And I, and I would also add on to that. I do think it needs to be in the striping point of order i've just made a motion so I, I would just ask that we can okay but i need to clarify the motion you, um, you said two different things so i can get behind that the town can either stripe it or delegate the striping i'm okay with that most likely they will not delegate it let's be honest right and they're going to stripe it but i'm i'm willing to that to take the condition out uh, i think it's basically trying to clarify you know in the past uh, with the special use permit, I think we said to stripe it. So what this does is changes that and says, do not stripe it. So I'm okay with, you know, um, adding that the town can delegate the striping, but I have a concern that we need to set direction and it's changed since the issuance of a special use permit. Oh, very well. So uh, I'll just make a motion then that condition number six be amended to add language stating that um, at the sole discretion of the town of Eskiuna, the applicant may complete any of the parking lot reconfiguration or striping. And uh, I'll second that. Yeah, okay, so, and then, so. Okay, oh. can I extrapolate? All right. Yep. So we have a plan here that shows a configuration. Now, discarding the county's four spaces, which is probably gonna affect two parking spaces here, which we know is gonna be a little bit of a, a continuous dialogue. They make, painting products that they use for utility markings that are not permanent. If Mr. Nicky was allowed to stripe with that type of stuff, it's easily scrubbed and removable. You don't have to blacktop over it. Um, it wears off over time. But if there is a hiatus between when the building permit is approved and when this gets executed, at least if the configuration had to be slightly modified or shifted, that could be erased and then the final striping with the agreed distances that the town could execute could be could be done very very easily it sounds as though laura correct me if i'm wrong has said that she's already raised the the prospect of temporary striping before building permit to the supervisor and the supervisor no, in, I mean. is intent on the town doing it correct but that, but that, you know, that's not lost communication, what you just said. So, you know, the town could delegate to do the temporary striping with the product that, you, that you're talking about also. So I think the, the motion and my second on that, on that condition would still allow what you're suggesting to occur if the town so desires. Yeah, and I just, um, just to follow up on that point, I do think that you have to address the, park, the, the, the actual striping because although it's in the town right away, it is a piece of this. It is a piece of this um, proposal. So, and, and that might be part of why the town is insisting they do the striping. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, any other discussion? We got a motion and a second to modify uh, that condition to include mm -hmm. that, you know, that the town, at the town's discretion, they can allow the applicant to go forward and uh, temporarily stripe. And, 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 and David gave a, a good uh, suggestion on how that could be accomplished without low cost and uh, easily to change. So that's that's the motion in a second. So we can take uh, action on uh, condition number six. Let's just do it with a show of hands. Any, unless there's any other discussion on that. All those in favor of modifying condition number six as stated by Mr. McPartland, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, five two with two opposed. Thank you everybody. All right, so we're gonna leave condition number three and number six is slightly modified. Thank you, Mr. McPartland. Um, and then I wanna talk about condition number two, possibly Mr. Diarpino. You wanna go ahead, Dave, or you want me to? Uh, I'd, I'd be glad to. But no, I can, I can uh, take this. I agree with the applicant. I don't see any benefit to affixing the tables to the ground, especially if they're going to be moved. I believe the applicants also talked about possibly chaining them together at night, just as a precaution to keep them from wandering and 
I mean, there's ways to do it, but I think you're going to be compromising the asphalt that's there. You have to drive a stake in. There has to be some type of rod or slip or lock that goes in that. And, you know, I just don't see what the benefit is. If the tables do creep onto the town's property, I think it's incumbent on the applicant to keep a tidy outside exterior place. And he'll probably know what the parameters are once he sets the tables up and where to put them back daily. Sure. What's the wind rating on the tables? On the whitening tables? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, a, it's a standard catalog, seen... catalog, standard catalog item. The purpose of fixing it was not because of the wind rating. The pur purpose for fixing it was to make sure it stayed within the property owned by the. I'm thinking it might have been both. Um, no, at the end, I'm getting a no. It wasn't. Okay. okay, I have a concern about them moving with wind because I've yeah. seen middle tables go flying, even large ones. Well, that concern would exist all throughout town, so I don't have that concern. All right. All right. So, uh, Mr. Derpier, so are you making a motion? So I have a motion to, to uh, just remove. Strike. Strike. Um, Number two. Item two. Okay. Any, anybody second on that? I'll second that motion. Seconded by Mr. McPartland. And I'd like to continue the discussion. A couple of facts that I think are important is I, you know, I've talked to Laura about this and, and I appreciate uh, what she's trying to do, but I also agree that uh, we don't need to affix them. Uh, especially, you know, with, with umbrella stands, we all know if we have picnic tables with umbrellas stands, it, they're not easy to slide, right? So that's going to help restrict um, them to their location. The other thing I think that's very important here is that we're going to have the barriers that are going to be converted to planters. That's going to delineate the space. You're not going to be able to move a picnic table beyond that. So when you have your site meeting, I mean, we have a net, we're going to have a barrier basically put in place that's going to prevent the picnic table from leaving the property. That's the way I look at it. And actually, you know, and I think if you, again, the agenda statement, Laura, you, you mentioned that most seating areas of plain board is proved have been contained with fencing or curbing. So my view is this is consistent with that because the barrier acts as fencing uh, or uh, containment, whatever word you want to use. So for those reasons, I, I support the uh, removal of that condition. Um, for those reasons. So any other comments, Paul? I would uh, support the chairman's position about the the umbrellas that could serve as some sort of uh, way to uh, keep the picnic tables in place and and the, the plans here state that there are going to be umbrellas so i think that kind of de facto does it without having to as mr yeah. dirty arpino says make permanent um you know uh modifications to actually stake those things in so I yeah. think it gets it done yeah actually thank you you just remind me one other note i had is actually so you start drilling too in the pavement you probably should you know have a location to see what underground utilities may be there so i think that's a lot more engineering so it's seems reasonable but it's it's uh, you know there's a lot of details even drilling a hole and putting a rod in so for those reasons i, I agree with the the motion uh is there any other discussion before we vote on the motion to strike uh, condition number th number two was it number two public Table shall be fixed. Any other discussion? The the umbrellas will be moved at night, right? Or when it's windy or if there's expected weather, they get the umbrellas get removed, but the stand stays still. Yeah, whatever is going to be the safest method based on. The yeah, I mean, you yeah. mean you can close the umbrella and strap it too, to keep it from wind from hitting. I mean, that's what I do at home personally. Just because it is a residential neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not going to put any. Yeah. Uh, it's going to blow <clears throat> off or knock anyone off. Okay. Yeah. So, and just so you guys understand where I'm coming from, my concern is that the planning board is creating conditions that cause enforcement burdens on the building department. Um, I think that when the outdoor seating is fenced in and there's a, kind of a clear delineation of where it needs to be, there's not a lot of things that can happen. Um, my concern without anchoring the tables in some way is that it, from day to day, we're a complaint driven office. If, if you guys approve a plan with the buildings in this configuration, it can be the neighbor across the road, it can be a planning board member, it can be anyone who can call our office and say, the buildings are out of, what well, you know, they're not in the alignment that they were. I have to send a building inspector out, they have mm -hmm. to verify the condition, and then we have to have a, a discussion with the property owner. I don't think that in any way, shape or form, he wouldn't move the tables back and he wouldn't diligently try and move the tables back. But my concern is with a condition like this, where the tables can migrate, 
is that it will be a burden to my office um, complaint-based if they're constantly being shifted around. I, you know, not even, I don't expect the broken in will be shifting them around. Human beings are chaotic. Um, and I really would recommend that you guys think strongly about conditions that create uh, enforcement. Uh, my point is, I think, the, I think the, bear, the uh, order barriers with the planners is going to solve the issue of them because there's not much real estate there. They're not going to be able to go far. Um, I, I, we talked, and I mean, at the end of the day or during the day, your, your staff will be responsible, yourself will be responsible for making sure that you, you know, abide by the, uh, the approval of the site plan. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. So. This is the safer option. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor of striking condition number two regarding affixing the picnic table signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Opposed. Opposed. All right. So five to two vote um, that it's uh, condition number two is re removed. All right. Any other uh, discussion on the resolution? We have a modified resolution with condition number two removed and condition number six modified regarding allowing the town to uh, delegate the responsibility of temporary striping to the applicant if they so desire. I've got two questions. One, I didn't see where there would be any garbage receptacle. And I think if you're going to have outdoor seating, it's needed. Do you have that in your narrative? We currently have trash cans outside. But they're not shown on there. Correct. My point is they should be. Okay. You're welcome to come take a site visit. Yeah. Well, I've been riding by. Well, how about we uh, put grow. that on the list for the site meeting that you're talking about? That make sure that the, uh, they're in an appropriate location. It doesn't impact uh, uh, pedestrian safety or uh, ability to uh, get to the picnic tables. And I maybe I missed it because uh, I've read the resolution a couple of times, but I do not see where. Okay, it prohibits the server service, which was the intent. Well, the resolution may not say that, but I know we've had significant discussion and we have the, uh, uh, the um, synopsis, I guess you call it, that the applicant submitted. And uh, we had a concern at the privilege of the floor. I don't know if that gentleman's still here or not, but uh, there's no drinks to be put outside. There's no table service, no wait staff that's gonna be waiting on these tables. That's been in our discussion and it's in uh, what the applicant has submitted, part of, you know, and, um, uh, and it's a community table. So if somebody buys a sandwich in the co-op and they want to sit there and eat their sandwich, my understanding is that's okay. And uh, I think it should be in the conditions. Uh, condition, what would the condition state? No table service, no alcohol outside. I think that's already a given. And also- the I think it needs to be in the document. That is part of the record as well, so. That's part, yeah. I mean, they're not going to be waiting on tables. We have, we've had this discussion. Yeah. No, we're, yeah. we're just, and if and if somebody walks out with a drink, well, I'm liable anyway. It's yeah. Liquor yeah. You're a big we guy. You're going to take care of them, right? So nobody gets out of our door. <laughs> All right. All right. I think it should be in trying to. You want to make a motion to modify the resolution? Tell us what you'd like. That there shall be no table service and no alcoholic beverages outside. Okay. Do we have a second on that? Second, hearing no second, looks like you can't get a second to move forward with that. I think it's already covered uh, in the agreement and with the paperwork that's submitted. Okay. And I will note that I think it's too many tables or too large, but I, I think we're really setting up an attractive nuisance and therefore I will be voting against this. Okay. Thank you. So just one thing for me, the neighbor gentleman who came and talked about having some nuisance complaints on this. So was he right? Did you like open the door on a hot night and? We had a Buffalo Bills game for our mm -hmm. air conditioner was not working. And so we opened the door, uh, they won and people were cheering and apparently he could hear it across the street. So Laura, has there been any complaints to? Um, I do actually think we received a complaint about the door prepping. Um, the door propping noise at the time. We've received, to my knowledge, at least one complaint on the noise, possibly two. I'm willing to bet it was the same gentleman, and I can tell you when it was because our ductless split broke. Yeah, it was broke for how long was it broken for? It was like eight days. We were yeah, I remember that. Okay, so it's fixed now. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, please take that 
into consideration, you know, what you heard tonight. I, of course. Okay. Any other comments? Um, I just had one clarification. I think I said this at the last meeting, but I didn't put it in writing. Is the bike racks, um, the, we're, the Metroplex is actually installing bike racks, I think, to the forward. And so I don't think that these bike racks need to be on the plan. Um, I don't know that you need a formal amendment. Um, but they may interfere with queuing on the ice cream line anyway, and we will be having bike racks all throughout the front of the. Um, I would love to see that drawing. I just yeah. don't have, and even today when I spoke to Metroplex, they said they're, they're in the very early stages and don't have any. I, I don't know. I'm getting conflicting information. So there's two projects, right? Metroplex is doing street furniture for the front within the county right of way that's related to the grant that just occurred. Which is not within the footprint we're discussing. Correct. Okay. And that I think is pretty close to being done and they would be, they'll be installing that shortly. Including um, bicycle rack. Including bicycle rack. Okay. I, what's very preliminary is trying to reconstruct that intersection. For, so, yeah. So I don't buy any bike racks. I don't want yeah. bicycle rack in sight. So they're gonna be running the bike. Do we, do we have a time frame on one bicycle rack installation is gonna happen? What's that approved? Just, I, I'd love to tell my patrons. Uh, on the front, I think like this this spring and summer they're talking about the street furniture that is separate from what they're doing on the glass. Right. Yeah. If we put a bicycle rack that's out there that's not impeding our traffic temporarily, so that people can park their bicycles in the spring and not lay them on the sidewalk when they're coming to ice cream, as it was proposed in our drawing, is that a problem? I mean, I think. I don't see a problem. I mean, it can be discussed again at this meeting that we got to have to and, kick and, things and, off. And clearly, mm -hmm. it's a theme that you're hearing from me. And I'm sorry if yes, this no, becomes yeah. challenging. Is if we can do it now, albeit temporarily, mm -hmm. and cater to people now mm -hmm. and their safety now, why push this down the line for some time in the spring or summer? We're at the spring. Again, we might have the opportunity with the meeting to do something temporary there. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good idea. So I put down at the meeting, we'll review the location of the trash receptacles and the bike racks. All right. Okay. So the only other question I have, and I'm sorry, when, could you just read back to me what the modification is here for the striping? Uh, the, the, the modification was, a paraphrase, is that the town uh, can has the opportunity to delegate the striping to the applicant. Okay, so along those lines, who is the town? The, the town is... Is it the, is it the planner? It's not, is it the highway it, department? Well, it's, it, the it's, well, the town is all of those. It's the planner, it's the highway department, it's the engineering, and Laura has the lead on uh, integrating... Uh, Laura would delegate. Yeah. Plus, After Laura would work with... Them. Yes, Laura would work them. Is that correct, Laura? Okay. Is there a chance you're going to delegate us to strike? So it's not my choice. It's um, I'm not the superintendent of the highways. I'm a communicator. Right. Yeah, and I don't think it'll change. Go ahead, Alina. No, I was just going to clarify that it's not Laura's decision. Yeah, but uh, she would yes. she would coordinate the meetings and work Correct. with the other but department heads. She's been having discussions with them already, so I'm just trying to get it. She we ever has been, but I think the question was who is the town, and I just wanted to clarify that Laura is not making the decision solely. It's sure. collective effort. Sure, the phrase is who is the decision maker as opposed to who is it's, the town. It's the collective department heads who are involved. Is, is there any point at which, if this doesn't get done, we can strike? Will we set a date that says if the town collective is unable to strike by X date, that will, it will be delegated to us as opposed to at the discretion of? The striping issue is something that came up with the special use permit. So I, I mean, in theory, I guess the town could reconsider the special use permit as it relates to that. But I don't think that that's what you're looking for. So I'm I would sure just let it play its course. We were, we, it's part of our original special use permit that we have to strike. Mr. Lang's been doing it. He took his time to come here tonight as well. So what I'm saying is, as was asked in the letter from... But what I'm saying is it could go back before the town board, and the town board could say it's our determination that we don't want you to strike it, and then that's it. The conversation's right. over. Well, then, so we'll, I, then we end up in the same situation where we're waiting on the town to strike it, right? Yeah, I think I think we understand your concern, and I, and I think yep. that the town hears concern. you, and they're going to do their best to, to move this along, uh, you know, based on the weather. So I, I have confidence we'll get there. Okay. I'm glad you do. I do. All right. All right. So we have a uh, we have a modified resolution, uh, striking, uh, fixing the tables, and modifying the uh, town uh, striping. Town being able to delegate to at least temporarily strike stripe or permanently strike whatever that they're choosing is 
And uh, we've already had discussion. Are we ready for a vote? Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Henry, you please call the roll. Mr. LaFlam. Aye. Excuse me, on the modified resolution. Thank you. Mr. Kahn. Nay. Mr. McPartland. Aye. Mr. Darpino. Aye. Ms. Gold. Nay. Ms. Strang. Aye. Chairman Walsh. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Modified resolution is approved by a vote of five to two. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you, everybody, for working through that. I do appreciate it. I know it's not, uh, but I, I appreciate it. All right. All right. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the next resolution, I need to recuse myself. Thank you. Um, because I uh, currently work with the applicants' council. Thank you, Ms. Strang. And for this one, Mr. Drescher will be taking your seat, uh, which is the seat of Mr. Scribby Tennis. So this is resolution 2023-13, a resolution to make a, a recommendation to the town board on a special use permit to combine 1725 and 33 Fagan Ave properties with the existing Kia, Kia automobile at 3900 State Street. This includes the removal of two single-family homes and the extension of the automotive sales lot onto F South Fagan Avenue. All right. Bear with me. I'm kind of starting to lose it. I don't know why. <laughs> All right. Further resolved, this Planning Board and Zoning Commission hereby recommends that the Town Board grant a special use permit to combine 1725 and 33 Fagan Ave properties with the existing Kia automob automobile lot at 3900 State Street, remove two single-family homes, and extend the autom automobile sales lot onto South Fagan Ave, as shown in the three-page drawing set stamped, received March 20, 2023, Planning Office, Niskew, New York, subject to final site plan approval by the Planning Board. The findings for this recommendation by the planning board are attached in this resolution, and that's something we're going to work through um, once we get a motion in a second. Mr. Chairman, I move for adoption of the resolution. Thank you, Mr. McPartland. Do I have a second? I'll second uh, the resolution for adoption, the motion for the resolution for adoption. Okay, um, you have to have some discussion. Uh, I think the, the key thing, well, there's two th key things here, obviously, everybody's opinion whether we move forward or not your vote uh right now the resolution is is written for that the town board grant the special use permit so that's the way it's written and and we are going to attach our uh, uh, our reasons uh supporting that that's required by the um, town zoning ordinance They're basically our report to the town board there was a uh, a late draft that came out uh for the special use permit application um I don't know, you know, obviously, uh, hopefully people had a chance to, to read it. I know it's difficult with people working and everything. Um, Mr. McPartland did have an opportunity and uh, his comments were incorporated as the project lead. So thank you for doing that, Mr. McPartland. Um, so anyway, that's it. So I guess we should probably go down line by line, Laura, and review this and see if anybody wants to add or make any other statements. Um, you want me to do that, Laura, or you want to take notes or how would you like to handle that? Um, yeah, because I I um I apologize for how late it came out. I I we question by question at the Conservation Advisory Council. It does work out. I will take notes and then I can create a draft. So if you want, I can just read you each one. I printed it out so I can write and take notes, and then based on that, we can we can yep. attach the you read? draft findings. Yeah. So okay. Does everybody have it in front of them? Yep. If you don't, put, you know, you can pull yeah, up on your computer. You email. can pull it up on your computer. Mm -hmm. I have a, I, I print it because I like to print things. So, I like to kill trees. <laughs> no, 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 I Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the and I and just um, to be clear, this is actually taken from the same report we did on the Holocaust memor memorial. So same questions. Um, and then I had special use permit questions. So. And, and I'll let you know ahead of time. I got, I had some. I was putting together bullets for myself. And I tried to bend where my bullets may be appropriate to add to this, and I'll try to do that as you as we move through it. Okay. Okay. And I didn't fill out the first one because it sort of follows to the end. But the first point that we made a recommendation on is the full conformance of the site plan with regulations of Articles Five and Six and all other provisions of this chapter, which is the 220-44 site plan review. Okay. I will tell you, and again, the other board members can speak up, but I did review those sections uh, today, uh, article, today, Articles 5 and Article 6, mm -hmm. opinion with reviewing those articles that were in conformance, um, subject to the final site plan approval. Because there's, I know we heard, uh, uh, you know, things we still got to work through, right? Once the town board, uh, if, if they do issue a special use permit, when we're not done with this project, it's going to come back to us. So my view is it's in conformance. 
uh, and it's subject to final site plan approval. And I also would like to state that it's it's a unique application. There's lots of bins, average density de development, PDD, PUD, all these things are listed in those different sections. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a unique unique thing, so it's not specifically uh, talked about. So, but in general, looking at, uh, because it's not mentioned and looking at the other articles, it appears to me to be in conformance. And we have the applicant online, by the way, right, Mr. Salvani? Yes, I'm here. All right, thank you for bearing with us tonight. You guys have unbelievable patience. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so anybody else have any other comments on that? Do you agree with, with what I'm saying there? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So the second question is the adequacy and arrangement of vehicular traffic access and circulation, including intersections, road widths, channelization structures, and traffic controls. Consideration will also be given to the project's impact on the overall circulation system as it relates to adjacent use. Um, and Patrick and I just put a note that the overall circulation was reviewed and the curb cuts on South Fagan Ave have been reduced to one. I didn't know if we wanted to continue and add anything there. Um, I just looking at my notes. Uh, I, I think you capture it. I mean, it's being reduced to one, it's one curb cut. We might want to also include that because of the location of the curb cut and you might have this later on, it minimizes uh, traffic going out to State Street because the reconditioning lot is able to access the Kia automotive lot without mm -hmm. going out there. Mm -hmm. so, and so that speaks to um, you know safety also. You know, minimizes curb cuts, speaks to safety. Any, any other comments from the board? Right. Um, number three is the adequacy and arrangement of pedestrian traffic ac access and circulation, including but not solely limited to separation of pedestrian from vehicle traffic, walkway structures, control of intersections with vehicular traffic, and overall pedestrian convenience. Um, I think one of the wins that we had looking at this project is the sidewalk proposed out front of the applicant property, which extends the intersection of the sidewalk on State Street. Um, the sidewalk's also separated, I think, from the street by street trees yep. and as an overall improvement to the corridor. I had no additional comments on that one. Likewise. Okay. Um, number four, the location arrangement and setting of off street parking and loading areas. Um, the, these ones are kind of, I don't know that they necessarily fully apply. So essentially I just, and Patrick and I just proposed that it's code compliant. Um, and that the vehicle delivery would improve overall site safety. Yep, the, the only comment I had, Laura, was site safety because it goes beyond the site because this prevents uh, yeah. tractor trailers from unloading on State Street because uh, yeah. now they have a place to unload and uh, right. the applicant is uh, going to make sure that they, they understand where the unloading area is when they transmit uh, upon final approval, if they get final approval, uh, this drawing to say, here's where you unload. So. I just want to change site safety to you know safety uh, on the site and within the Route Five corridor. Uh, I wouldn't put money on that happening. Well, we, we got to try. I watch too many of the haulers unload their vehicles on Central Avenue and State Street. Well, they have an regardless of the availability of other arrangements. But they will have the availability to at least here where they may not have at other locations, right? That's that's the only number four. That's the only thing I had, Laura. Anything else, anybody? Okay. No, that's good. All right. Number five. The location, arrangement, size, and design of buildings, lightings, and signs. Um, I think we've been talking a lot about lighting, but the lighting and the signage would need to be provided to the planning board for final site plan approval. But it's the board's understanding that lighting will be minimal and security based, and we're not expecting any additional signage on South Fagan Ave. Um, and I, I, I agree with that, Laura. The only thing is that the lighting, uh, based on the evidence middle, it's not, it's um, security and safety. I just think we need to add those words somewhere in there. It says security base, it's also, also safety and base. Safety. Okay. Yeah, and that's what the applicant was saying about you know, the low level lighting for you know, what they're unloading at night or walking the site. So it's a safety thing. Okay. And that's all I had. Six, the adequacy type and arrangement of trees, shrubs, and other landscaping constituting a visual and a noise and or a noise deterring buffer between these and adjoining properties. Um, this has, I think, been an important discussion item.
recommend that the planning board can continue to work with the tree council and the applicant to increase the buffering, especially for the homes on South Fagan Ave. Um, the only thing there, I don't know if it's applicable to this one, Laura, is I, I mentioned that we had additional green spaces to be added to the other properties to improve the corridor appearance. Uh, like the, well, the applicant shows that they're going to put some greenery at the uh, reconditioning center, um, possibly both sides. So additional green spaces added on other properties or other uh, properties as part of this application to improve the corridor appearance. But it's still a net loss of green space. Um, but this, this additional is to uh, other properties, not to the, to the site. It's to yeah. like the, you know. But overall, it's still a, a net loss. It is. It is a net loss. But the, I mean, the question more goes to what what type of a noise and visual buffer is being established to protect the neighborhood. To protect. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I I would say personally, it seems as though they've provided ample buffering. Um, we often defer to tree council's judgment on what's the most appropriate type of buffer. And uh, so I, I like that we have kind of, um, you know, deferred some judgment to them as well. Yeah, I think another important point, I just look in here that may, may, may apply here or somewhere else is that yeah, I think the original submittal was 44 parking spaces and the current plan is down to 90 parking spaces in order, in order to uh, provide uh, all the things that we requested, such as the green space and the truck capability for offloading and all and all those things. I don't know if it includes somewhere in there, just that it was 144 and it's down to 90 now in order to Im improve uh, the appearance and functionality of the site. Um, and number seven is uh, regarding multiple family complexes, so that's not applicable. And number eight, the adequacy for provisions for the disposal of stormwater, sanitary waste, water supply, fire protection, oh, uh, water supply for general fire protection and general consumption, solid waste disposal and snow removal storage areas. Um, we did have them delineate the snow removal areas on the plans, they are delineated. There's no significant change to sanitary water, water sanitary sewer, that should read. <laughs> um, water supply, fire protection or solid waste disposal but the storm model will need to be examined more closely during final site plan review. Yep, I had no comments. Laura, did we wanna make any comment here as to what type of review would be performed? I don't know that we've discussed yet whether or not a TD would perform that review or outside or inside engineering. We would need a TDE for this one. It's, uh, it's a significant amount of disturbance and they're proposing uh, stormwater management yep. areas. So we pretty mm -hmm. much always have to get a TDE for that. Yep, that's stated. Yeah, so well, I, I guess it is stated in yep. the yeah, TDE yep. the next. Yep, the next uh, point there. Yeah, the next one is kind of similar. The ad adequacy of structures, roadways, and landscaping in areas with moderate to high susceptibility to flooding and ponding and or erosion. Um, we do have poor soils in Niskayuna. I don't think the site is any different. So we made a note that the engineering department and TDE will have to review the stormwater management plan and the issue should be examined more closely in final site plan review. Those are similar to the notes that we had on the stormwater management for other site plans. Yeah, I do have one comment. And the only comment I have is, is uh, I'm concerned with the, the use of the word issue because issue is you know, negative, that there's a concern. And when you look at the sections in the zoning code, it talks about whether um, uh, they talk, instead of saying issue, it says consideration or subject or the matter. It doesn't say issue. So I would suggest that we strike the word mm -hmm. issue and replace it with, uh, uh, you know, consideration, yeah, either consideration or matter is appropriate, or this subject should be examined more closely. So, right? It's not necessarily an issue. Okay. Number 10 is protection of adjacent properties against noise, glare, unsightliness, and other objectionable factors. Um, we, I think we said this before, but we're requiring a strong visual barrier to homes on South Amherst Ave and South Fagan Ave to protect the residential neighbor, nature of the neighborhood and to protect the adjacent property values. So do you want to change this to this subject should be examined more closely? In yeah, exactly. Anywhere there's issues, you know, again, if you look at the uh, the code, those sections, it doesn't say issue. It says considerations or subject or whatever. Yeah, it should be examined more closely yeah. in the final site plan. I agree that needs to be examined. Just that may not be an issue. Okay. 
Number 11 is retention of existing trees for protection and control of soil erosion, drainage, and natural beauty. Um, the applicant did identify the large Norway spruce to remain, as well as several trees along the backyard lot line with South Amherst Ave neighbors. The tree council can work with the applicant to identify any more tree, if any more trees can be retained in the new planting plan. Um, so this subject should be examined more closely in site plan review. Thank you. Can we go back to 10 for a minute? Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever asked if they were planning on having a PA system that would cover the property. I would hope they would not, but we could ask. He's on, we can ask him that. Uh, Ms. Gold, that's accurate. We, we actually choose to not use a PA system as much as possible. We, or we text uh, with all of our employees. So you do have one? There's an existing one that Fusillo had that was on the building. Certainly, we're not going to expand what's there, and we and we use it pretty minimally. Yeah. So we can put a note not not going to expand PA system. That was for 10. We could do that. That would be helpful. Okay. There's yep. a huge issue with the dealership across the street. Okay. When Mohawk Commons got redone, it, it kind of got knocked out. <laughs> because a lot of their need got knocked out. And then 12 is not applicable. It has to do with multifamily again. So um, uh, Mr. Khan brought up that we also should be making our recommendations to the town board on the special use permit. I broke out the special use permit criteria that we look at to make recommendations to the town board. This would be very similar to what we would do for the Mohawk, um, the Mohawk one as well. Um, so this is all in one paragraph, but he broke it out to each kind of thing that's in parentheses. The general character, general character of the proposal is complementary to the existing parking um, and disharmonious to the existing residential homes on South Fagan Ave and South Amherst Ave. That was um, just, I think, my sentence that I popped in there. I'm happy to. It states reality. Mm -hmm. okay, Mr. McFarland. Yeah, you know, um, I just my general comment about the general character is you know, in, in re reading the comprehensive plan statements about this um, neighborhood in town, there's a lot of reference to um, balancing the need of residential and commercial. So I think this statement fairly puts forth the, those, how those needs are balanced and how the, the impact is, has, has, um, a balanced there's a balanced impact we'll say and uh in reading the, the yeah I, at least pull it forward to you no. I, sorry I, I keep hitting it with my elbow so i'm trying to keep a little distance um in looking at page 77 of the comment which talks about the state street corridor there shows a deference towards towards residential um i mean the second paragraph of the state order says uh, development of this area is a concern as other sections of State Street outside the town's limits have undergone substantial large-scale development. Uh, the town should continually seek out sound development opportunities that will enhance the corridor but not significantly transform the current character. Um, even even at the, the very end of that, it says um, you know, it talks about uh, not overwhelming uh, adjacent residential neighborhoods with development. So Mr. Drescher, I'm glad you raised this area of the comp plan. Um, when I first read the excerpt that was provided by the planning office outlining the goal, which I think we can all get behind to not have commercial development overwhelm and consume residential, um, that definitely rang true to me. However, when I read this whole excerpt in its full context, um, I find that that full sentence, which begins with development and maintenance of the sidewalks, curb cuts, and roadways by the state have made the corridor attractive and allowed the street to maintain its low density development, clearly shows that this statement about avoiding the overwhelming and consuming nature of commercial development is a statement of how development has occurred over the course of many decades and many iterations of our comp plan. And um, this, this commercial tenant, this commercial occupant has, has been here for all of those. Um, 
So well, I think I think it's important to recognize that this commercial use has been in existence for quite some time. And um, certainly when this latest iteration of the comp plan was written, um, you, you couldn't deny that any statement made about current conditions would be addressing the auto dealership that is now Matthews Auto. Yeah, but again, looking at that last sentence, I mean, it does, I agree. It says development and maintenance of the sidewalks, curb cuts and rural waste by the state have made the corridor attractive. But when it says development, it doesn't necessarily mean active development. It also could mean passive or the lack of development uh, choices have made it uh, appealing and not overwhelmed. So again, I think when you read this, there is a consideration and even a hint of concern of not allowing commercial to overwhelm and, and overstep its bounds. And I think taking down two houses, that's that goes against page 77. Fair enough. And then you're entitled to that um, that interpretation and, and those feelings. My, my takeaway from, again, a few excerpts of the comp plan, I noted um, on page four, um, the comp plan specifically states that um, the document itself is a roadmap that sets out broad goals and objectives and um, that should preserve valued community characteristics while allowing for the enhancement of smart and sustainable growth. It's accomplished by maintaining an appropriate balance between residential and commercial needs. Um, page 77 also in the same paragraph as, as the um, statement you are pointing out says that the town should seek out sound development opportunities that enhance the corridor but not significantly transform the current character and so therein lies um, our responsibility to ensure that there isn't a significant transformation that it's in keeping with the general character and so you know before before we get too far down the road here i just want to point out to the group that um, there's one item that we will get to in, in due time regarding the general fitness of the structure or use to its proposed location, where I think we'll have, be able to have an even more substantive conversation about this. There's another area of the comp plan, page 86, that states, and I, and I quote, a continual theme that has been advocated in other areas of the plan is to maintain a balance of commercial and residential development. And as one of the authors of the last two comprehensive plans, I will tell you that Mr. Drescher's interpretation is exactly what I had intended. We were concerned about these areas. And at the time, I didn't even realize that the commercial, highway commercial zoning extended that far from State Street. But I never, ever would have wanted that to be interpreted as an endorsement for tearing down two homes that are by miscuna terms, more affordable, even if they do need some work, that are close to a bus line, clearly walkable to the bus line, mm -hmm. ideal for some folk who don't have many opportunities in miscuna to find a home that works for them. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think it's an endorsement by no means. You know, I think it's a balance, as Mr. Uh, McPartland said, and so it's up us to, you know, make the recommendation that we feel that it's reasonable. Um, and, so. Um, telling you, I don't feel it is a balance. Yeah. I think it's giving away current homes for commercial development, period. If I can just point out, page 86, if you look at the bottom, it does say proactive measures can be utilized by the town if it felt it was in the best interest for the future. So if we are feeling that, you know, this sets a bad precedent of tearing down homes, especially affordable homes, we can be proactive. So, you know, I do want to note that I, I do appreciate the applicants' concessions they made and all of the um, suggestion, you know, they've taken all of our suggestions. And if it wasn't for the houses being torn down, I likely would be pending on the table in favor, but I, I can't get myself past that, especially looking at the comprehensive plan. And I've been looking at it a lot since our last meeting with regards to this, uh, this, this plan. And added to that are the ongoing discussions about how there's a statewide shortage of housing, particularly affordable housing. Niskuna doesn't have a lot of affordable housing and we're taking some away. I, I can't get beyond that either. 
No, no. As you know, once we work through this, it'll come to a vote. So, mm -hmm. all right. So rather than make a long statement at the end, I figure as we go through, I'll just point out my concerns. <laughs> okay. No, thank you. And as Mr. Uh, uh, McPartland just stated, um, um, next one just talks about the buffered areas and then the general fitness of the structure or use to its proposed location. And this is the one where we get into the comprehensive planning board. The planning board finds this proposal helps sustain small scale commercial business on the State Street Corridor. It also feels the 2013 comprehensive plan is neutral on future development in the Stanford Heights neighborhoods. And that's specific to the Stanford Heights. So. You know, that's kind of where the, you know, you know the, the, whether you believe it's meant for State Street or if you, you know, it, it doesn't specifically say, you know, that, uh, uh, the, you know, this application is unique and it doesn't either way support it, you know, pro or con. I think that's the bottom line. So it's up to us to, you know, to make the recommendation. And I remember how this board fought for the neighbors of a commercial property across the street to protect their neighborhood. Which one's that? R.J. Murray. Hmm. All right. We put limits on their operations. We made them put in some good screening, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what works for you know that stuff again? The applicant has submitted the uh, at least a preliminary site plan, which uh, you know addresses a lot of those concerns with the the green space, leaving the tree, all the things we just talked about. So I, you know, I think we could leave that one personally, as, as stated. Again, if you disagree, well, we'll come to a vote. Uh, remember, we're this is a a positive uh, recommendation to the town board. Uh, street capacity, uh, okay, automobile automobile parking and storage. That's what it is, and it's compliant with the code or provisions in the code to allow what's happening here. Uh, st uh, street capacity and use, um, no capacity issues. Current offloading of vehicles pro problematic. Uh, and so this, uh, so this would be on-site offloading, sidewalks a benefit. Sorry, Laura, I'm just trying to move this along. Okay. Public health and convenience, the planning board finds as an important component of this proposal to ensure there is no light pollution from the parking lot onto the adjacent residential homes. And that's what we're, you know, we're minimizing and the applicant is minimizing their lights, willing to go lower. So all that's true. Preservation of general character of the neighborhood. On one hand, development is disharmonious to the residential character of parts of South Fagan Ave. At the same time, the area of South Fagan Ave near its intersection with State Street is, it has for a long time, been of commercial character. Uh, going back to public health and convenience, you didn't address the noise issue there. We did before, I know. Or the issue of uh, exhaust, et cetera. Well, these cars are going to be parked, you know. It's well, a, it's cars a have a way of getting moved. Yeah, but, but I mean, every car gets moved. I mean, some of them get moved a lot. I spent a lot of time on car lots over the years. Yeah. Uh, and then, therefore, be it that the current site plan mitigates some of the impact, some of the impact of note <laughs> to the neighborhood character through landscape buffering and designated location for vehicle offload on site. And this proposal is made possible by the mutual agreement of the existing residential owners of 1725 and 33 South Fagan Avenue who desire to sell their homes to Matthews Auto. Additional findings, uh, if there's anything else we can add it. Uh, the only other thing, Laura, I, I thought, just looking at my notes again, um, we did, we did uh, the applicant has agreed basically to combine the parcels to minimize the risk that this could become independent business on South Fagan. They have to. They have yeah, to. I mean, have I just to. want to make you know note of that, but it is yeah. already shown on the drawing. There's a note on the drawing that states that, so I don't think we need to add it, but I just want the record to reflect that uh, their willingness to do that. Yeah, we changed the way that we actually describe the project, even in the special use permit, yeah. um, so and that it states that the lots are to be combined. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, that was clear in the description. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. And any reference we make now says um, it's a special use permit to combine 1725 and 33 Fagan Avs with the existing Kia automobile. Okay, thank you. And uh, Laura, obviously, whatever happens here, if it goes forward, we'll, uh, you know, I'd be glad to look them over again just to make sure. And then Mr. McPartland, I'm sure, would help out to make sure we got it captured before we send it on to the town board. Yeah, okay. um, and I, I appreciate you guys taking a look at it so quickly. I did have a note on the preservation of general character of the neighborhood, which I know I've discussed with you guys before, that currently there's two residents that are um, directly adjacent to commercial property, and this proposal would make six or eight. I had it in there and I removed it. I think it actually is eight, and it was an increase of six. So um, 
I did. I do think that's important to note. I know Patrick wanted to remove it. You know, I think it's okay to have conflicting points in a a recommendation of the town board in order to clarify if you're ever going to have a different recommendation that there were points of contest in here that may have been, you know, balanced out. But I do think it's important to note that currently there's only two homes abutting a commercial property. And in this proposal, you're increasing the number of commercial homes that are directly abutting um, commercial properties. Yeah. No, Laura, I agree with you that we should include it. You know, I think we need to be factual in the findings. Yeah, there's no problem. And besides that, the you know, town board uh, obviously has the opportunity to either approve or deny or approve with conditions, and they can address that if they so desire. Okay. All right. So I think that's it for working through uh, the recommendation of town board. Laura will uh, update uh, the draft version, and um, and if we vote to send it on, you know, then we'll... Uh, Make sure we re review it for accuracy before it gets forwarded to the town board. All right, so we have a motion and a second. We work through the things. Is there any other discussion? If not, um, I'm going to call for a roll. Any other discussion? Um, I guess I'll bring up a discussion. I was out last week, and I did see some of the video, but um, does anyone on the board have a recollection of a very clear re redesign or an, an end zone redesign of the reconditioning lot to optimize the parking and flow on that portion of the commercial facing side of the land that they own. Does anyone have any recollection of that? So we, we gave them some feedback we, as we, we have um, continued to do the latest revision that we received does reflect the improvements that we suggested. So there's an addition of a landscaped Island at the corner of State Street and South Fagan Avenue on the reconditioning site now, as well as a landscape buffer, which Laura recommended between the reconditioning site and the existing home um, just next door on South Fagan on the same side of the street. Um, and then there is a, they've also provided a plan that shows all the parking lots striped so that we can have an accurate count of the number of um, is spots. That, is that what, is that look, is what that you're that looking happens? at there is more of a, a rendering that shows the landscape buffer, but separately there's a different plan that counts out the spaces. And um, so what's what's been provided is, is what was requested at the last meeting. Um, so do, I do, Thank you for explaining that. Was there an increase in efficiency in the parking? Do you recall? There's the there's an improvement in buffering, certainly. Buffer, yeah, I can see that. Um, you know, we're 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 losing some impervious surface in in so improvement and in, in so making those improvements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think my from what I've gathered from the applicant, the lanes of traffic through this site are wider for, by design because they're, this is a more active site where they're moving a lot of cars through new and used inventory. Um, so I don't know that there's much more opportunity for um, removal of impervious surface. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, again, we'll have another opportunity to give it another swag um, if the town board passes it back to us. This isn't final, but I, I think I recall the applicant stating that uh, the nature of the business of the reconditioning center is, is different from the storage area or from the lot itself. Uh, cars are coming and going quickly and backed up, you know, to prep them for sale because that's they also prep the cars there, is my understanding, not only uh, used, but uh, new cars, you know, take off the uh, shipping and, you know, clean them and get them ready for the... Uh, new owner. So um, I think uh, if you have some more concerns about whether that site's being unutilized, we can we have another opportunity to, to talk about that. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, can I jump in on that? Sure, sir. Yeah. So Mr. Laflamme, you're, you're absolutely right. We did have that conversation and it did um, develop into a further conversation where I think the board was looking at that property as a parking lot and something that we could use better for parking. And absolutely, if that was the case, there's a way to design that to um, to accomplish uh, some par some additional parking spaces. But that is, in and of itself, a very different business um, 
and with the movement of cars over there constantly, uh, if you were to take a snapshot of the overview of it during a day, you know, with it, with a, you know, a minute by minute camera, you'd see the ins and the outs. So um, I, I respect the fact that looking at this overhead shot from Google maps makes it look like it's very underutilized and it has been underutilized historically before we purchased it. But, I, but I'll tell you um, there are parts of the day where if you were to go over there, at a certain time of the day, maybe after a truck has just dropped and we've loaded that lot up with all the cars to be prepped, you would see that it's very well utilized. It's just, um, you know, it's it's fluid as Mr. The, the chairman said, and, and, I, and I explained that to Mr. McPartland as well, is that uh, the the use of that lot changes hour by hour throughout a day. So you, your analysis of it is very accurate from a static, standpoint looking at it saying what could we do better but the dynamic use of that property makes it um not as easy to lay out like you would an inventory storage lot i, I appreciate the explanation it, it this is i'm really challenged by this decision i um i i'm more in i'm more aligned with you know mr drescher's interpretation and mrs gold's interpretation of the com comprehensive uh plan the the only reason why I might approve this is because I would like to see what the town board's perspective is on this. So we do have a chance to re reconvene on this project if it were to be approved by the, the town board. But I, I want to say that the amount of concessions that you as the applicant have made in response to our comments is significant. You know, the spruce tree, finding a way to keep it, um, the, the, the buffering, uh, the solving of the, of the safety issues. I'd feel... I'd be irresponsible in some regard not approving because of all the benefits and concessions you've already made. However, I can see the one house being torn down is already surrounded by commercial. I don't, I don't, I don't think taking a second one down is consistent with a comprehensive plan, even in this unique commercial residential area. So I was really hoping to see a, a more optimization of the commercial facing side of the property which I think you did a good job explaining the fact that I'm thinking of it as a static fixed parking lot versus its use. That's a very good point that I needed you to explain to me. Um, and I was hoping that you could keep that second residence. And I know you've already taken a hit on parking spaces, which is a great, you're listening, you're collaborating, you're making a concession. So I, I don't, I don't want to penalize anyone for that, but I was just hoping there was a way to maybe keep that second residence. So. Those are my and at the last meeting. What's that, Mr. LaFam? At the last meeting, and I don't recall if you were there or not. But I was we not. did have that discussion, and um, there was extensive amount of work with the engineers to try to figure out a way, and not even looking at it from saving parking spaces and reconfiguring. It was it was if we saved it with with what was left, um, what was gained was. Uh, was a was a home in disrepair that we 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 would become a landlord and, and we're not in the business of being a landlord so what we you know although we considered it and tried to figure it out we kept coming back to the point where the business that we're in is is automotive and we need automotive um and if we could save that house and make this project pencil with saving the house we tried but at some point it just becomes impossible to do both i appreciate the response any, any other discussion from the board there's one minor thing and i was struggling where to fit it into the list and i couldn't come up with it but it has to do with the current nature in the absence of this parking lot there is how many miles is it from the morris avenue lot mr um two so uh, a, mile, a mile and a half or two miles so, so there is this whole concept of extra cars on the road, extra emissions happening repeatedly, True. right? If this parking lot were not to be there, they would have to continue as business as usual, right? I mean, I didn't think it was a big enough factor to, you know. Oh, I see uh, what you're saying. I couldn't find where to put it in there, but. Mm -hmm. so, so, you could, so you're concerned about the, the environmental impact of, of the cars? So, so there's a net environment benefit for having the cars okay. brought to the lot, gotcha. parked on the yeah. lot. And traffic. being transported right, yes, between exactly. that, Morris Road and here, right? Well, not that that will go away, but well, 
Yeah, my only concern with that is that um, you know, soil is a great absorber absorber sure. of greenhouse gas emissions, yep. and you're uh, adding uh, an impervious without knowing if you're truly having a delta sure. sa net save of greenhouse gas emissions. Agreed. I think the argument could be made that mm -hmm. potentially making more greenhouse gas emissions. Right. Agreed. That's why I. I mean, I'm. But it's, I it's the kind of the last straws here, right? So. Right. You could also make the argument, though, is that uh, my understanding is that that they lease that space. And at any time, they could also lose it. So to Mr. McPartland's comment and the comp plan about striking a balance, this gives a balance uh, to help uh, a business, a longstanding business within town. And that's why I'm going to support it. Mm. Look, at the end of the day, we, in our recommendation to the planning, to the town board, we are making, we're defining what that balance means here, yeah. right, for us. Yep. Right. Yep. No, they'll, they'll have their own public hearing and 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 make their decision based on our information plus uh, the guidance uh, provided in the zoning ordinance. And it goes to the town board regardless of our recommendation. Right. Um, yep. The only other thing that I wanted to note was the planning board department put in a note in the in sort of the end of the findings where you can add additional things. I think. Uh, for the Holocaust Memorial, we had talked about sort of a maintenance plan for the future and even a potential, like what to do if it, you know, um, went under and mm -hmm. demolished. And Clark and my planning intern had been talking. I, it would not, is whether or not we would want to ask as a condition of the special use permit that if the use was discontinued, it would be up to the applicant to remove the asphalt. Um, to see if in the future um, the land could be returned to green space or residential homes. So, Laura, I had a question on that. Being that we are combining parcels, how do we, how do we actually, as a matter of course, call that out without entangling asphalt that's been there for 30 years or so? Yeah, I mean, I could defer to Elena. There's probably a way that you could um, delineate what area that you're talking about. Yeah. Just um, attach a map to the yeah. yeah, yeah. My Can recollection of the, the condition that was granted on the Holocaust Memorial was that it was unique to the Holocaust Memorial and that the it was actually born out of the applicant mentioning to us that prior to breaking ground, they wanted to ensure that they had all the funding secured in addition to a reserve set aside for the, um, the deconstruction and removal of that memorial should it ever cease to operate as such because they would not want a abandoned Holocaust memorial existing in the town of Niskayuna. Yeah, that's my record. So that I, that the, I I I hesitate to sort of extend the precedent, if any, set with that special use permit recommendation yeah. to this. And, and the other thing too is that it seems like there's quite the business need here. Uh, so the only way that I think that, that this would occur, that it wouldn't be functional, sur supporting 3900 State Street, is if the Keeler dealership were to build and go elsewhere, and a lot were to come for sale. And then when when we do a change of tenant, if the new, a new somebody new came in there, uh, I mean they, they have to follow the same guidelines of our approval for the functionality and the operation of this this area, right? It doesn't change. So I mean, the only thing that could happen is they would try to sell it, and then it would have yeah. to come to us for a subdivision. So it still would have to come through us. Right? Yeah, my my concern is actually that it gets along the lines of what Chairman Walsh is saying is that you know some years down the road we either the current dealership or some dealership or some other entity that they sell to wants to put a building there, yeah. right? To conduct business out of a building, right? Uh, you know, uh, but again, it would be, it'd be folded into the existing parcel. That's right. It'll be, so they would have to subdivide to do that and it would have to come to us. And I know we're not in favor of having a, a kiosk there and another used car lot or something. So no, no, but it, it uh, in the case I'm talking about there, let's say it's this, this existing dealer. Business dynamic change five years down the road, they want to basically add another building. We're going to do indoor car parking, right? We're going to put a little Carvana 
uh, kiosk there. Right? Maybe not. Have to come to us, though, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, agree. They'll have to come to us, but yeah. by then our hands are. Yeah, it wouldn't need, yeah. would need a special use permit. Is that what we're discussing here? I thought we were discussing that if the this purpose changes, well, and the lot is excessive, that the lot would be removed before the grantor tran transitioned it to another owner. Yeah, that was the discussion. Um, I think you guys already know that the planning department lands on the side of that this is against the comprehensive plan and its encroachment onto the residential. And so one of the ways that we were thinking about possibly mitigating that would be um, that if the use would change, that it couldn't, like these lots couldn't go to another commercial use, like outright. Mm -hmm. They would have to demolish the parking lot and put it back to green space and then you'd have to start. For a change use. For a change of use, yeah. Yeah, for a change of use. But if it was another dealership, if it was like another use, dealership, we could be faced with an right. expanded. Because special use permits, they're not specific to to names. They're specific right. to use. Yeah. The, the only concern has They're not open-ended. They're not open-ended. The only concern I got is we, the discussion with you. Annex, even if the properties are annexed together, is that true? No, I think it's permanent. The special right. use permit would be, no, well, it's permanent with the use of the lot. Correct, but this becomes a very attractive lot mm -hmm. for commercial future, development. For commercial development, correct. But if it's not used for a year, the special use permit's gone, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And well, there's true. something else you should be aware of, since we're discussing car trends. There's a fight going on in many states to allow manufacturer direct to buyer sales, which would get rid of a lot of car dealerships. Some states are fighting it, and some are buying right into it. So you can't say that there'd always be another car dealer to come in. You can't. Um, but I, one thing that I, has been mentioned several times in this process, and I just would like to reiterate, I think what's brought in this project so far to this point and what, what really underpins my support for this project is the fact that all of these parcels fall within the commercial highway right. district. And yeah, and I not and I feel compelled at this time to remind the board of some of the permitted principal uses, of which a applicant could come before this board in acquiring 17, 25, or 33 Fagan, and submit a proposal to establish a eating and drinking establishment, fast food, sit down, takeout restaurants, hotel, inn, motel, general business offices, professional medical and non medical offices, wholesale distribution facilities commercial recreational facilities, including bowling alleys, billiard par parlors, and health clubs, a bank, retail stores, a food market. These are permitted principal uses. Don't need a special use permit. All you need a special use permit for in this area of town are automobile sales, animal hospital, vet clinic, kennel, and an indoor theater. And you're saying that's true for all the lots on that block? Yes, sir. Yeah. All the way back to Albany Street. All commercial. No, all of the parcels that, that are, are in question proposed is combined. Yeah. As a matter of fact, 33 Fagan, the last parcel down Fag down Fagan Ave, is the end of the district. So this would bring basically all of the parcels on Fagan that are in the commercial highway district under one umbrella. And, and again, I the other thing too is that. You could, you know, the town board has the opportunity, depending on how they act, to, to we really didn't have a lot of discussion with the applicant regarding, you know, um, you know, having a, a bond or whatever to be able to turn this back to green space. So one way of handling it is is not do anything at this time. Town board will have an opportunity. If the town board grants a special use permit, you know, might, might be a condition of our site plan approval to add that. Uh, if we get there. Well, it could be a list of things for the town board to consider. Yeah. Well, we can list it to consider. Sure. Are you okay with that, Mr. McCarlin? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in their ultimate authority, we've already seen how they can modify. Um, I think with the average density development that came before us for <clears throat> Kells Farm, the town board um, decided to change site access. We, we had proposed a Windsor Drive connection as a part of our uh, sketch plan approval, and the town board said you'll have to find a different access. Mm -hmm. So. I accept that. I, 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 I feel that the recommendation we make um, should be um, 
you know, the best representation of our collective interpretation of the COP plan and, and how this fits into the, the larger, um, you know, town zoning. And so that's that's where I come down on this. Okay. So if I understand correctly, then we can at least add that, that there's an opportunity to, to look at uh, returning to green space if the site doesn't function as intended or whatever words we want to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Under the right, additional but not, findings, but not just necessarily. town board can consider. Consider. Can, consider. can I ask? Can I ask a question around those things? Could we also include rebuilding a single-family home? I don't think so. Yeah, okay. that sounds. Yeah. I, I just figured I'd ask. I to revert. <laughs> Now's the time. Right? Mm. All right. Any other discussion? Mm. Any other concerns? So I think we're ready to call the roll. Is Mr. Henry Mr. still with us? All right. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Mr. Laplan. Nay. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. McPartland. Aye. Mr. Darpino. Nay. Oh my gosh, we lost. Ms. Gold. Nay. Ms. Strang. Uh, 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 Mr. Drescher. Nay. Chairman Walsh. Aye. So it looks like uh, one, two, three. It looks like the, the resolution fails. Uh, and I'm making a recommendation by a, a vote of four to three, four nays and three ayes. So what do we do from here? Um, goes to the town board anyway. Yeah, do we do we do that? Yes, it does yeah. have to go to the town board anyways, but it, since the resolution was for it to be a positive um, recommendation, then obviously the opposite of that would be a negative. So. It would just be a negative recommendation with the comments that have already. Do we done. need to call the roll and say that's a negative and recall the roll for the record? Say deny. I think by default it is. Okay, but I just want to yeah. make sure. Okay. Yeah, because that's the only other alternative there. Yeah, it's the only other alternative. All right. Well, um, so what about? I mean, so I'm just as a matter of process. Does the applicant understand that the board is now? going to take a vote to recommend that the town board that grant or denies, sorry, denies the no, special use permit. Not be I think we just decided we already voted. So yeah. it basically it, by default, by it's default, it's going to be reverse. So, you know, it's going to say, it's going to say uh, deny and the A's would, you know, that's why I said we could call the rolls and, and I mean, it. you can, but in theory, what's already been voted is that it is a negative since yep. The motion was for a positive that failed. The only other alternative is negative. negative. Yep. And they'll see how we voted. They'll see the numbers, right? And right the now. comment and the discussion is all going to be part of. Yep. yep. Wait, only concern is the findings. If you just give me one second. I don't think the findings are changed. Yeah, they shouldn't change, right? Yeah. Because they were both you inclusive of concerns vote? and, right. or not concerned. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, both positive and negative. So they were already. Okay, but our North. Um, <clears throat> Sorry to be a pain, but it says if the report of the planning board is unfavorable, it shall contain the reasons for the recommendation well, for disapproval. Good point. So I think it's okay to present the the um, failed resolution, but I think it would be important for the majority to at least um, list out reasons um, that I can include uh, in the recommendations yeah. that, that I can include in the packet to the town. Thank board. you, Laura. That's excellent because that is in the code. Yeah. Thank you for doing yeah. that. So, so I think you're suggesting that anybody that voted nay just, state why yeah, for the record. And then I'll just add those reasons in. The, well, uh, I can start. The body for the most part. Okay, okay, but do you mind re-summarizing yeah. for me? Yeah. yeah, just basically. I would. I'll, I'll start. If that's right. uh, the but the percentage of exposure to commercial increase is too great, and there's one too many houses being taken down. I also don't think they're optimizing the um, reconditioning center, but that's I'm not an expert on that, so I trust everyone else's opinion on that. Okay. Who's next? I, don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> yes, uh, David, I can. You, I can yeah, David. <clears throat> okay, so the the intent of the State Street corridor and how it harmonizes with the residential was to be somewhat contiguous, not to start to encroach by taking down residential properties in order to, um, in order to achieve the development. Uh, the other thing, I know that it's part of the special use permit, but I, I still have big problems with a 
parking lot being a principal use no matter what the zoning is and i know that we've had other applicants here on the town for that and i also agree with the uh, the points that uh, mr laflam made about um taking down the two homes primarily to put a parking the only comment i would have it's not a principal use because it's going to be combined it's an accessory use to the 3900 street once they combine a lot so it won't be a principal use just a, for clarification Okay. Okay. And my point piggybacked back really on what Mr. Drescher had said, quoting the comprehensive plan, the intent was to balance things and to not disturb residential to commercial. And I pointed out that we've got a dearth of affordable housing. This takes two houses in a third lot that could be an affordable house, all with easy walking distance to the bus line. And it takes them out of that and makes them commercial, makes them parking lot. And I know that the town has a dearth of affordable housing. And a dearth of housing on public transportation lines. Oh, you got that part up? Yeah. So I do want to just reiterate how I appreciate the concessions and all of the um, acceptance of our recommendations and working with us by the applicant. But in making my decision, I had to look at Article 10, Section 220 60. And then on page 77 of our comp plan, uh, the State Street Corridor, primarily the second paragraph of the two. Um, I just, the overarching purpose of that, that paragraph to me, and, and it just exudes a concern for an over encroachment of commercial onto the residential. While there is commercial and there's acknowledgement of that in the state street corridor, um, there is, in my interpretation of, of the language there, um, a concern for preserving the residential a little bit more than the commercial. And I also look to page 86 of our comprehensive plan that says protective measures can be utilized by the town if felt it was in the best interest for the future with affordable housing issues throughout the country. But also here in this um, I think being proactive for the future means preserving our affordable houses, especially again on, on the bus line. So I, that was the reasoning behind my decision. Okay. Thank you guys. Because it wasn't um, mentioned before, because because um, I didn't mention it before, I'd like to just mention now that I did give some consideration personally to the desire expressed in the comp plan to preserve affordable housing. And by my interpretation of what affordable housing is and how it's defined in the comp plan, I don't see how either of the two homes that are being proposed to be demolished would qualify. So I, I would encourage those members who find this as a, um, and a preservation of affordable housing to reread and perhaps refine that definition for future iterations of our comp plan. It talks specifically about multifamily houses as affordable. Um, and, and I also just think it's important to note, if you had made a site visit, you would have seen that um, neither home really appears to be in a, in a marketable state. So, um, you know, as a new buyer of the home, um, you know, I, I question its affordability. I think, I think it'd be quite expensive to be a homeowner on 17 Fagan or 33 Fagan. Furthermore, 33 Fagan is owned by the same person who owns 25, and that's a that's a lot of acreage to purchase. You would probably. I see it. I see it sitting home. vacant. But I must take exception to your inference that I did not make a site visit. I didn't go with you on your site visit because I'd already been on my own. Plus, I'm very familiar with the area. I've walked it in the past. Okay. 
<coughs> Any other does, comments? Does the applicant that, well, know yeah, where we're yeah. yeah, Mr. Sal Salvani is online. I, I'm sure he's heard what we have to say. Right, sir? Yeah, no, I, I've, I've heard it. Um, obviously very disappointed and, and knowing that we had the proper zoning and overcoming almost every one of your concerns in, in making all of this concessions one-sided from our side, uh, continually to make concessions. I just, I, I'm shocked that we're at this point. Um, and, and I know my executive team will be as well. Um, you know, the, the additional time and investment we made in making this everything that we thought would help you uh, see that this site could be something else, as Mr. McPartland pointed out, and we know that as well. I mean, you could have a warehouse there. You could have a storage warehouse there um, without a special use permit. So we, we started with a request to put in a parking lot, and we ended up providing a park is how I look at it. And, and then to be at a point where, um, you know, the, the, we're, we're trying to protect or, or, or we're trying to balance. I just feel like the, the, there isn't balance. There's, there's a lot of effort on our part to create balance. And, and I just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm honestly shocked that, that it went down this way. It still goes to the town board. You can still make your case to them. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Ms. Cole, but it does help. Uh, I've been I've been down this road many times. It does help when we go through all of this with the planning board to put this effort in so that we can get on the same page before it goes to the town. And that's what we we're trying to do here. No, and I, and I appreciate personally, you know where I stand, so there's no secret. And I appreciate your hard no. work. And, and I understood the concerns along the way. I really did. But but every one of our meetings we seem to get one step closer in, in understanding our position and us understanding your position. We pivoted uh, in every case where we could. And this comes down to um, just, you know, one or two items that, that we could not overcome and should not had to overcome based on the fact that we are zoned for what we're asking to do. And I think it's time to go to the next. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Well, no, I appreciate your comments and uh, you know where I stand. I mean, I, where I vote it. And uh, yep. again, my, my position is we need to also help businesses as much as we need to protect the, the residents. Uh, you know, it's a balance as Mr. McPartland saying, I fully agree. And uh, maybe the town board uh, will see it uh, the way the, the minority on this board has. So uh, good luck with the town board. And, uh, and, Thank if, you. Uh, and we'll, uh, if you come back to us, we'll do what we can to make this a, a great project as, as, all the hard work that you've put into it and we appreciate your hard work i appreciate your recognition of that thank you all right all right thank you all right okay all right okay uh, we got some discussion items i'm going to move on quickly because i know it's late night and everybody's like ready to pass out so uh the, the first discussion item is on Antonio park miss gold if you don't mind but the bottom line i asked for this to be on there because Antonio park we, we called for the public hearing uh let's face it you know it, it didn't happen when it was was expected to happen and because of our meeting schedule it's three weeks out for the public hearing. So all I want to do is ask for a tentative resolution. If we come through um, any open engineering items or if we can condition them, if the town uh, planning department can draft a resolution, can we have a tentative resolution for the Pulsinelli subdivision? And I had planned to ask for that. All right, and if we can do that, if something comes up there in the public hearing that surprises us, we can always pull it. All right, mm -hmm. okay does everybody okay sure. with that? Yep. No concerns? All right, thank you. On 1757 Union Street, Bank of America, we have a site at plan application for a new signage. Took a look at the application. It's basically uh, replacing signage, a little bit different color. Uh, there's no waivers uh, that I recall. Like, oh, there's no waivers. It strictly uh, requires a review. Town Planning Department has uh, uh, suggested that we approve it. In fact, I think one sign goes away, and the other signs are basically functional signs, to, you know, about the height for the drive-through. So I don't have any concerns with the application. So I'd also like to call for a tentative resolution approving the sign package. Um, Everything's in compliance. Yeah, everything's in compliance. The applicant is on and we do, we have the applicant there. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that, uh, sir. Who we have online for the? Uh, this, is, this is Tom with AJ Signs. Uh, yeah, you you got it. It's pretty simple. Yep, and we appreciate you hanging out with us tonight. Sure. And we'll call for a tentative resolution approving the changes. Oh, I, I mean, I don't. You know, the color. Eh, 
you know, for me, but again, it's uh, it's a corporate identification. So if that's your corporate colors, you know, we, we we're usually pretty lenient on that because yeah. it's your colors. It okay? is more red than what's there right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So please, everybody take a look at that and we'll have a tentative resolution for that. Any other concerns yeah. on that? We okay? Okay. So next is 1851 Union Street, 1245 Ruffner Road. Thank you to the applicant. I don't know, can't thank you enough for hanging out with us. It was quite the meeting tonight and we appreciate it. And for the public for sticking around, if I assume that people are staying for Ruffner Road. Very impressive. So, um, we have, you know, dual project leads on this, uh, Mr. DiArpino, yes. Mr. Khan, you know, we heard from the public tonight. I, I don't want to diminish what the public has to say. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't really catch anything new personally, uh, but you know, there are some good, some good points and I do appreciate the comments from the public. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes. So let's leave it so at so that. I just wanted to cover the logistics. So we do have a TD, right, Laura? Um, yeah, we selected Weston and Samson because we we have actually used them on the Mohawk Golf Club before, so I don't think there's a conflict of interest. There, I was going to say for the record, Laura, no conflict. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yep. Okay. And that, so, so, and for the record, that means that the Mohawk Golf Club has no affiliation with Weston and Samson. They don't use them for anything. Weston and Samson is entirely our DE yep. that reviews for them. Nor do I as a consultant. To Nor Mohawk do you Golf as a consultant. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, you know, Ms. Kimmer, you got to... I mean, it was there, obviously, in the code. And, you know, I've quoted it several times, but you were able to see with the previous applicant or two applicants ago that we are going to go through a findings list. And, um, you know, I definitely see the comments from the the comments from the neighbors will serve to define, in addition to the comp plan and the zoning code, the character of the neighborhood. But we need to go through all the other items in terms of, you know, the technical items that the TD is going to be looking at, water, the sewer, the force main, right, all that. Yeah, we do understand that, Mr. Khan. As I mentioned before, because of the amount of time we've been spending on the project, we have advanced the our engineering drawings to a point where we're ready to sit down with the TD and we can start to deal with a lot of the misconceptions and, and maybe perceptions of what's available relative to utilities and site drainage mm -hmm. and you know, we're, we're certainly not shedding water now onto other properties. We don't intend to shed water in the future to other properties. We think we've got roots. Well, we know that water's not an issue. We believe we have a sewer route that will not increase capacity at all, as it might have been if we were trying to go to the same line that Kelts Farm is on. And we're fully aware of the situation with DEC and what the implications of that would be. Um, so obviously, we've got to deal with, with the comp plan and the balance of character. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be an interesting question and discussion, how do we quantify what one person's definition of character is versus another? Because from my perspective, I'm building something slightly different, but complementary to the existing neighborhood. Is that in keeping with character versus someone who wants to see a 1962 colonial bill in 2023 that you couldn't even do under the current state energy yep. code? So those are going to be the balances that... Right. And I, I, I do think that we, we have a lot of factors on character that we'll be able to look at, right? We've gotten the community's inputs on that. And look, two applications ago, right? You can see that at the end of the day, the board, you know, there were all independent members of the board. Yep. And, and when and it comes to, go ahead. I was going to say, I hope you picked up. We we did go back and, and maintain the 50 foot buffer. We uh, saw that. That we committed I saw to. That. Yeah. And look, um, counselor, um, I did confirm with Mr. Rutherford that if the town was interested in any type of a right of first refusal, that he would consider that. Yep. And and Laura, there was one point about the length to the cul-de-sac. I think right now this exceeds that 500 foot. So what what are our options there? It it does, but it's I believe the code reads should should right not yeah. shall that shall so right yes. I mean it, that clearly came across. That's why I said what are our options because yeah. the language of the code was not was not imperative. And just for a point of information, Mr. Khan, the, I believe the state building code allows up to 750 feet for a cul-de-sac with no emergency or alternative access point. And our 60, well, not 60, our um, easement would provide that emergency. Yeah, you'd access. have to measure it off the easement. Yeah. Yeah. The easement to route on the old design? or the On easement? the old design would be the emergency. So that would give us an alternative egress point yep. in the future. So what used um, to be... I, I, was a, I don't know if the board was. I was a little concerned about the connectivity discussions. And, uh, you know, it's certainly something that we're willing to do. But I heard from some of the 
presenters that they weren't so interested in that connectivity. And I guess I would defer, you know, at some point when we get to that level of conversation, I thought it was kind of nice that we were trying to connect connectivity, but I didn't hear that loud and clear tonight. So what connectivity are you referring the, to? The walking, the walking path. path. The walking yeah. path. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think folks were worried about getting hit by golf balls. Yeah, well. I'll tell you, we had neighbors opposing sidewalks on Windsor. All uh, right. And now that they're in, they're there a lot. Yep. They're well used. Well, we are, we are more than happy to do it. Yep. And also, knowing Mr. Wood for quite a while, I was a little bit surprised by his concerns because I don't know that he became a civil engineer, but um, the <laughs> trying that Mr. Kimmer's put okay. together certainly allows for 60 feet. Um, and we never did expand the 11th green, just for the record. Um, we replaced a lot of sod in the back of the green and recreated the shape of the green, but we didn't expand it because I've made that statement before that we mm -hmm. haven't made any significant changes to the golf course. So the, the one thing I do want to bring up for the board and Laura, you know, the gentleman, Mr. Spain, who's still here, right? So his property is going to become, you know, surrounded by roads and all but one side. Yeah. Yep. Well, so where is that exactly? Where? It's the northern, the it's northern 12, phase. 1219. Although the road is going from the south, yeah, it's, that yeah, one. That one. Yeah, I think. Well, so there's going to be a 50 foot buffer. Um, I mean, the right of way, the right of way is not going to be touching his, his rear. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think maybe now that we're doing technical things, maybe Laura, you can include me and David on um, at yeah, least the emails. The, so, and I'm um, I'm just trying to have a regular engineering highway meeting and bring up planning projects. Okay. But when we have specific meetings, I can definitely sure include yeah. you guys. But David, that makes sense, right? For I'll be, I'll be happy to involve you all. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. well, I think at any point. I think. He well, I, if you're talking to me too, I would, I would like to be. Yeah, it was that. It was that David. That that David for <laughs> oh, that. David. Sorry. I thought it was. Um, I think, you know, just looking back at my notes here, you know, I started a couple of things. But one thing that was interesting is that I think we had one speaker say that the traffic wasn't bad now, but no, our past meetings and traffic was considered bad. You know, I, like I said, I've driven over there. I just get again yesterday, um, and. You know, depends on obviously what time you go by. I mean, I don't know if you guys live over there, but it depends on what time you go by. You know, if it's whether it's schools letting out or works letting out. But every, every time I went by, you know, probably in the middle of the afternoon, like two, two to four o'clock, there's very few cars over there. You know, it's more the it's more the runway. Yeah, it's, it's more, more that, that so straight and people go a little too. Yeah, far. and like I mentioned, that's you know that if that's an existing problem, I think I mentioned at the uh, last meeting, maybe it was last meeting meeting before. I said it's people that are speeding are our neighbors. It's us. Yeah. So think about that when you drive in another neighborhood because you know it's it's not somebody else. It's it's us. You know we got to. Well, I know Mr. Party's here, and I maybe we can get a you know, know, speed yeah. sign installed mm -hmm. on Rougher Road uh, and. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing, um, we, there is one. Okay. There is one. In, there is one installed. Yeah, is so there one there now? A per, yeah, more permanent solar one. I don't know. Oh, it's Laura. a solar one. I'm thinking about maybe one of oh, them. Oh, mobile. And then and park a cruiser there. And, uh, <laughs> Billboard. Yep. yep. Uh, the other thing. every neighborhood wants that. Yeah. Well, maybe just until just you about change, every neighborhood. change behavior. Mm. I think there also the thing was somebody actually said that, you know, we shouldn't go this far and dismiss the application. You know, obviously we need to take uh, the application through the process. And that's where we had the uh, presentation from the planning office a couple times uh, reviewing what the process is for an average density development. Right. So we're, we're going to follow the process. We're not going to dismiss it. Thank you for that. You know, um, so you got to follow the process. And I was uh, quoted as saying that it's uh, one of the hardest <laughs> projects. So therefore it should, if it's that hard, it must be no good. And that's, that's not what I, I did say. It's hardest, but it is one of the hardest projects. So was uh, the key one that we just got through. And so yep. was uh, uh, monuments or um, uh, what do you call that? Mansion Square. Mansion Square. And so was just Windsor been, Drive. You, so you've just been doing this so long. There's, there's lots of hard ones. <laughs> and I'm going to go back when we, you and I did Hillside Commerce Park. Hillside Commerce that Park. That wasn't yeah. looked upon by the neighborhood very fondly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. so it's, uh, you know, I, I understand. I understand it. It's, but hard is, part, is, is what we're here for. So yeah. I, I wish they were all easy. Chairman Walsh, I did um, write down questions. I know you guys probably didn't have a chance to read all of the comments yet, um, but we don't always get to have the back and forth. So if 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 there's a couple there's a couple planning process questions that I'd be happy to just put on the record for anybody sure. looking. If yep. you yep. don't mind me taking the time, um, there was I, I and I started them. There was a couple e emails and questions from the public hearing that um, I think hopefully we can answer one of the questions would would there be a traffic study um so surrounding residents can understand the impact of this development i believe that the applicant has submitted some traffic data mm -hmm. um we can use the tde to determine if that's sufficient um but yeah we do collect data on traffic um to understand the impact on the development of the residential <laughs> system um what will be the mitigation for all the tree removal we do um, typically go in and try and save as many trees as possible. After that, um, we do require planting plans. And typically, if you're clearing this much, you would have to do street trees even off site. So I know we've taken a pretty hard stance on mitigating for tree removal. Um, how will the surrounding neighborhood screening be maintained or improved? Again, it's early in the process, and it's this is the recommendation on the special use permit, but potentially you guys could look at adding plantings to the buffer too, like evergreen plantings, uh -huh. something that could be discussed. Um, we do look pretty heavily at the buffers. Um, another list of questions I saw was, uh, he asked, is it legal for a residential home to have three sides of the property uh, be surrounded by roadways? I don't believe that's prohibited by code. I do believe that has an impact. Um, a, the question on the cul-de-sac, I do. I think we talked about that. The town standard tries to keep it to 500 feet, but we'll have the town designated engineer look into all of the codes. Um, Clark, Clark has started that as one of the first things for the town designated engineer to really weigh in on. 
Again, independent review of the long-form environmental impact statement. We will have the town engineer look at that. The uh, conservation advisory has council has also been going through that um, piece by piece and has a meeting on April 3rd. Um, the town engineering sewer and water study completed. Has that been completed? It has not. I know we've talked about that that needs to be done. Um, we can decide on timeline. It, it, I mean, it has to be done. Um, uh, the financial burden on the sewer water system expansion, NISC unit tries pretty hard to make sure that water sewer system expansions are um, collected and accounted for and paid for by the developer. So as part of the things that come out of the town engineering water and sewer studies is if we're at capacity, what um, needs to be done to mitigate the impact of the development and that um, is paid by the developer. And have the Town Conservation Advisory Council and Tree Council completed their reviews? Um, they have not. The, I think that the CAC is getting ready to do a recommendation to the Town Board on April 3rd. The Tree Committee, I think, has been waiting for better weather and kind of honing in on the proposal that the Board was going to work with. But I know that the developer has offered yeah. to do a, a site walk. So I'll try and get them out there. I don't have mm -hmm. final reviews on either of those. Laura, if I might, with the snow and the rains that we've had, if we could wait maybe into the middle of April so things dry out a little bit. Because even walking on the golf course right now, right now it's really wet. So Okay, that's fine. I mean, the Tree Council, they do everything from negative 20 degrees, which they really have done to wetlands. And well, as long as, yeah. as long as they got boots, but. then the, the water. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good whenever they're ready to go, Laura. Yeah. Be good. Laura, there's yeah. one other question I think that keeps coming up that we never addressed since you're doing it. They came up again today. The planning board contacting the school district. Oh, right? can you comment on that? Yes. Um, no, but I will try and do. I will try and do that for the next meeting. Well, I mean, we've had a history. Well, we do have a history of contacting the school district with no response. Um, I know, but I don't mind reaching out to them and asking them. I they actually they they will contact me occasionally. It's not very often, but. When they do, I'd say it's almost like maybe t every two years, they do a reanalysis of um, the number of children that they are expecting. And they do reach out to me and ask for pending development. Some of that development hasn't occurred. And sometimes we have new developments. They kind of keep track of it. So I don't mind reaching out. They, they do have a way of keeping track of it. But I haven't asked them specifically okay. about about right. this one, they don't. And I'll support Laura on that because I have sit, I have sat in meetings with the school yeah, with uh, superintendent to discuss, you know, upcoming projects so they can take that into consideration in their planning. So, uh, something we try to do. Obviously, if residents have a concern; they could also bring it to the school board so that they understand their concern. Also, um, how many young families? Because well, based on who are getting interest from for the townhouses, I'm going to say that's zero impact because they're either singles or empty nesters or young couples at this point. Uh, I'm assuming 10 houses, average household, I think is two and a half kids. Um, so maybe 25 kids added to the school system between K and 12, call it 30, call it 40. I don't see it being a significant impact, yeah. but I think um, you may get even fewer. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing obviously, yeah. but you know, whatever school district needs, we'd provide. And the other thing, Laura, to your to your point about questions, a lot of the concerns that we heard are works in progress because, again, for the, per the uh, the process that we have to follow, we don't resolve everything now. You right. know, we still got to come back to if the town board grants the, the special use permit, we still got to work through all this stuff. It's not this right. isn't the final, you know. Yeah. Um, yes. So, Laura, timing wise, we're looking to go through our findings discussion and everything else. When is this going to be the 17th? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, the, I guess there's two paths forward. Um, based on the comments we heard from the public hearing, you guys could call for a resolution um, for recommendation of the town board. Or, based on the comments we heard from the public hearing and us hiring the TDE, we could on the 17th prepare findings and look at the findings from the TDE and then call for a resolution at the next meeting. I think our timelines work either way. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend the second option, David. Well, what do you if, think? Mr. Yeah. Khan, if I could, just because you've only got one meeting in April and it's the 17th, and with the town board only meeting once a month, if we don't take action until the first <laughs> Monday in May, uh, I'm looking at May 23rd, I believe, 
or town board, if there were a way that we could address the comments and, and ask for a resolution on the 17th, can I get on the April 23rd town board meeting? Because I still have to do a presentation meeting and then a public hearing, right? Right. I mean, the town board is going to call for a public hearing at the one meeting. So as you're in, that's right. another. But it's May. But yeah, if I have to be, wait till May for the first June. meeting, then I'm June for a public yeah, exactly. hearing. So that making the 17th the resolution meeting saves me potentially four to five weeks. Easily. Yeah. yeah. If there's any way you could consider that, I'd appreciate well, it. Well, I, personally, I think we can. Yeah, but, you know, because we have three weeks between, and I know the planning department has a lot of work and Mr. Henry, but we got three weeks. So if we can at least try, right? Yeah, we uh, are planning to have the TDE comments by the next meeting. But I, but I mean, it will, it, that would be. I, I, I think, I, th I think, I think it would be rushing things to actually do the TDE comments and our findings and a resolution all in one meeting. Well, question. Um, do we really want to be addressing TDE comments before we even know if the town board is going to approve it? I do think that they're yep. pertinent to some parts of the well, I understand, but I, I'm not going to start running up a bill if I don't know that the town board is, because those TDE comments, as you know, get pretty involved. Yeah, um, no. they're going to be commenting. I on, think, though, if I can interject, I'm pretty positive the town board is going to want the TDE comments. So they're really, gonna, yeah. yeah. Okay. Since there's a question on really basic elements like sewer and water, it drives it forward for me. Okay. Normally I'd be fine waiting on the TDs, but those are really <laughs> big questions. Yeah. And if well, and I don't know if we're, or the town is in a position to give me a qualified, quantified answer either at this point. Um, we think we have a pathway to make it work, but it also involves New York State DEC. Yeah. So There's, the TEE can make suggestions and recommendations, but I don't know that we're going to have answers. They can tell us if it the, seems feasible or not. Yep. Well, Matt's already told us. If it's not us, feasible, it seems, you don't have a it project seems feasible, either. feasible, but we still have work that we have to do collectively. Yeah. Laura, does the TDE show up with his comments, or does he just submit comments? Um, I would say most of the time they submit comments. We have had them come mm -hmm. occasionally um, if there was a particularly technical review or you guys had some <laughs> questions for them. We've had both the town engineering and the TDE come to meetings yep. before. It just seems like a involved project. It might be something to consider to have them, the other questions that may pop up. Just yep. So we'll probably get a five-page comment letter from him that we'll have to address. Yep. Um, Actually, yeah. I mean, if if I may, I, I think at this point, I'm totally fine with the TDE reviewing this project. I mean, if I was the TDE and I was looking at this, there's really not that much they can comment on. And, and I, I think that they could have some comments, and I, I just don't think it's going to be much. And I don't think it would really hold you guys up from forming resolution. Yeah, I mean, the, T the TD comments at this point aren't the complete comments because we only got a, we only have a preliminary site plan. Right. right. However, I do think I do think that we need to give this a tremendous amount of thought and take all those inputs in. Well, and I think Mr. Sweet <clears throat> doing something faster here, I don't think is going to be wise for the long run. Well, I mean, no, we it's just unfortunate you've only got one meeting in April. Yeah. That, and then the, the monthly for the town board. I mean, yep, right. Easily. Understood. But I think I think it's worth the it's worth the care to. Well, I mean, the it. other option is you know again, and I I'm just going to throw it out there is you you call for a tentative. We see if we get the TDD comments in. We you know we, we got to work on you know if we draft up the uh, the referral like the one we went through tonight ahead of have time. It, have it prepared and have we, it prepared. We can at least you know uh, see, see for there and and say no and and then. I would appreciate that. I mean, I, I mean, I would, I would, I would recommend that just because of the. So, the time. so I'll, 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 I'll defer to Dave, but I'll say, with all due respect, Chairman Walsh, I don't think that that's the right thing to do with this. So I, I don't actually think it'll change their timeline. Um, I am not comfortable bringing the project to the town board in April. Um, that's I, I, but I am comfortable. Um, that meeting's in a month, though, Laura. But I mean, we we haven't even really dived into the TD or drafted the comments. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend putting it on the town board at, for the end of April. In which case, um, I can bring it up at the first of May prior to the planning board's 
you know, making a recommendation so that it's in the pipeline. But I think actually it would be brought to the town board in May in either timeline case. It might be in better shape to go to them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Understand. I mean, Elena can defer Just to me. Just understand but... the applicant's exposure. If I'm spending all that time with the TDE and I'm waiting for my first town board meeting in May and my public hearing won't be until June, and I've addressed all the TDE comments and we get denied, that's, to me, that doesn't seem to be a reasonable process. I mean, that's the process that... I well, one, one, one way is that when we get the comments, right, or you get the comments, there's some that are going to be significant and some that aren't, right, that we can resolve later. So yeah. I wouldn't spend the time, my view is you don't respond to all of them, you respond to the ones that are important to the town board, to this board. For instance, yep. you know, is a uh, Rosendale sewer connection feasible? And is that going to, you know, doable with whether it's grinder pumps or a pumping station or whatever? Yeah. That's an important and one, I, right? I, we heard that from the public, right? So I don't think yeah. we need to focus right. on. And I'd like um, to reiterate what, you know, the town attorney said, right? The, uh, the town board is going to want us to do this. I, I think that's fine. I just don't think that we're going to get TDE comments. And, Agreed. And uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but we'll no, see no, what no. those comments are. Look, we are going to live through the reality of getting those inputs, right? I do want to remind you, since you know, I wouldn't have brought it up, and Mr. McPartland brought it up before. There was one piece of data that had the town board reject the planning board's recommendation. One piece of data, one single number. Mm -hmm. There were there were there were fifty things that were talked about, but it came down to one single number that had them reject the recommendation that we made for Kelts Farm. Well, maybe, so the point I'm making with it is that we've got to live through the process. We've got to give it the time that it needs. We've got to see the data. We've got to see the comments. We've got to see the math behind it and engineering behind it to the best of our ability and be able to then tell the town board from our findings, here's a recommendation or a negative recommendation. And then maybe a suggestion if you, Mr. Khan, Mr. Garpino, Laura, Dave, and I could review the TDE comments in their totality and decide sure. which ones you believe are most important for us to address. Definitely. And then we that's focus a, on that's, those. That's why I said, it, I think now is the point in time where, you know, if. And that's what I was just saying. You don't need to yeah. address them all and spend the money. Still going to push me to June for public hearing, yeah. but. But the other thing, too, is uh, I think we need to, you know, work on the, the recommendation like we did tonight, obviously, sooner. And we can maybe, maybe put that, maybe we can start that for the next meeting. Uh, because, you know, it'll give the public and the applicant an opportunity uh, when Harris talk about it to, mm -hmm. and say, hey, I, you missed this. or you, uh... I, I definitely think in the next meeting we should be discussing okay. findings. All right. We should be discussing. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. No, we'll, we'll, yeah. Yeah. Instead of waiting. Yeah. You know where I stand. Yeah, I guess. So there were a few things that I did since the last meeting. I asked the planning department to give us a little bit more information on Chapter 220 mm. and the average density development, which Laura was able to answer some questions. Um, the other thing I did was I went back to a couple proposals previous where you did the several iterations that showed the development of the club. They were great, great aerial photos that showed the development of, of the neighborhood. Yeah. And 1922, 42. Correct. And, yeah. and you could see moving to the east, everything expanded. Yeah. So I know that there's a natural progression to neighborhoods and, you know, where the demarcation lines of where development stops. And I'm going to come back to the fact that it, it would be great if we could find a secondary connection to connect it, to make it part of the neighborhood. And I don't want to see a house come down. I think that's, that's, that's not a good precedent, but the cul-de-sac may be the end all of this development. If this gets approved, that that's the termination point. I mean, you, we may come up to say, okay, look, you just can't connect whether it cuts through the club or it just the landscape over near 14. You know, we, we don't want to start taking houses down in order to make connectivity. But, you know, looking at this, if the average density development doesn't get approved at the town board level, are you prepared to come back with another plan to start the process over with single family homes? And this, and here's where I'm going with this. The, the aerial view that I see is that these lot sizes are very small compared to 
the general size of the property, the homes. So if it means some smaller lot sizes or larger lot sizes or whatever it is with a reduction in, in the townhomes, which you go back to R1, and you have a mix of R1 single family homes, is, is that something that you would do if for some reason this thing goes down the line and doesn't get approved by the town board? I, as I stand here, I would say to you, it's probably something we obviously would, would consider and okay. want to consider rather than totally abandoning the project. Just another thought for you, if we were to show a future connectivity point off of that cul-de-sac, like that became a bend in the road, hypothetical, mm -hmm. 30 years from now, the golf course is sold. That road could be extended or and reconfigured become or parting, right? part of a bigger neighborhood again yeah. so that we don't show it as an absolute forever termination, but an opportunity to be able to continue off of that. That'd be something we easily could do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did do that one other overlay too, where Dave compared the density of like blocks of Ruffner and Waymer. Oh, right. And, yeah, that's what and I was looking at. We were looking, because we've got to dedicate so mm -hmm. much land to green space, yeah, the lots do get smaller, but when you look at the total density of similar tracks, we're no different yeah. than another block on Ruffner or block mm -hmm. on Hawthorne, or it's just, you've got to Yeah, get so not even reiterated it today, right? It still rounds to 20 houses in that block. And someone, I'm, one of the comments from the public came in today, it, it rounds to 20 houses mm -hmm. on that block. Yeah, so on a 14-acre parcel, it's... We certainly can talk about future connectivity. What? The lots are quite a bit smaller than any no. of the surrounding lots. Agreed. Well, well they are agreed. because, 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 because we've got yeah, because yeah. we've got the green space because the ADD. Right. One of the frustrating things listening to the Rough and Road people is they want to preserve as much green space as possible, but then they argue for this traditional single-family development, which eats up a lot of that green space. And well, I don't. Let's say I don't think they're arguing for the single-family development. <laughs> they don't oh, argue for no uh, development. Couple of them yeah. have. Well, I would agree. They were saying consistent with the actual Rosendale right. neighborhood, they and that would, would that would lend which itself. Would be R one full-size lots, eight thousand right. square right. foot, right. and houses like theirs, which you can't right. build. Yeah. And that's and that's where we follow the letter oh. of the law in the process. You have we hard show hard a map of twenty-two gonna... single families with minimum eighteen thousand square foot lots. I'm... The reason that the lots end up having to be smaller is because of the green space requirement and the ADA. Yep, yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna say to the public, you know, that they just need to study that one a little more carefully and rethink it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I mean I think it goes to what you guys have to balance in your recommendation to the right. town board. Um, mm. you know, I think a lot of the concerns you heard are harmony with the existing neighborhood. And I remember Mr. Giopino at the last meeting said I think it would be important to make sure that. The homes, if this were to go through, were aesthetically, you know, varied and hopefully compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and I think it's something to think about: is look at the single-family plot and look at the average density development and weigh the pros and cons. And I do think a couple, and I can lay it out for you, but there was a couple mentions of some of the codes that you want to look at in your recommendation there is a whole nother section in average density development mm -hmm. that we should probably put in our findings mm -hmm. so i can send you those questions ahead of time but i mean they are there is similar language to the special use permits that you got to think about i know i i don't know if it was spoken tonight i think it was um a decision on whether or not um we would take parkland fees parkland in lieu of that could potentially change the number of lots if you were requiring the parkland to be set aside for this subdivision. So some of the conversations that we normally have later are probably mm -hmm. worth having now. And yeah. some people were insistent that the average density of development let them put more homes in. Well, and it doesn't. doesn't. You guys, I want to get away from what the people said. Yeah. And, right. well, you right. know, it, what the condition, but, the things that they bring up are important, but I, I don't want our conversations to tend towards what can we do to make that that happy. I think we heard very strongly that there's a concern on character of the neighborhood. So I really think that that's important that's for right. us to explore. Exactly. I, you know, we've heard a lot of concerns about 
the preservation of natural and scenic qualities of open space. I really think that's important for yep. us to explore. But in our world, so let's pull no. out the yeah. code. Yep, no, let's I agree. Yeah. No, thank you, Laura. Yeah, so that's section five right. and yeah. section six is where the ADD is just specifically yeah. we, called yeah, out. But we don't yeah. need to go back and forth with yeah. specific comments. Yeah. yeah. But I'm saying I agree, that I agree, Laura. Banks need to highlight that they don't get more units for this. What they well, the town gets instead and the residents is that you do get more green space, more preservation of wildlife and all of that. It's not a ploy to get more housing in. Yeah, yeah that I mean, the Very average true. density code does not allow more units than is allowed under a single family. Right. Right. And Laura, just one additional point of clarification on the architectural side of things and the compatibility. I, we have submitted um, renderings of the proposed townhouse with Mr. Darpino's suggestion to swing the garages to the side, which we were able to make work. We're expecting and anticipating that every one of the 10 single families are going to be custom built. We're not looking at going in with three styles and building the same three styles over 10 lots. Each one of the homes will be the buyer's choice as a custom built home. So a little different maybe even than some of the newer subdivisions that are mm -hmm. being built where you might have five or six styles to choose from. We're looking at each of the 10 lots being a custom built. Yeah, style, as, style that the it can be custom as long as they they work together. They work they together they right, yeah. Because I've yeah. seen where uh, well people buy a lot and they put yep. up a house that doesn't go with all the other ones around it, whether yep. you know throwing their money away or it, the well, other extreme. Hey, drive through Windsor. There's yeah. a great I, example. I, I, so it's I, worth I, a conversation. Contemporaries, Tudors, Colonials. Yeah. Yeah. If all ten of the townhomes are the exact same townhome unit. Well, they're different only from the standpoint that we're going to put one story units together and two story units together, and they're only six buildings. So there'll be three, probably three of each. But it may still even be worth looking into different roof lines or something on each of them. Wouldn't want to get into creating something. all those architectural plans, but we certainly could deviate. No, I don't think we need no, to take I mean, the architectural yeah, yeah, that's plans a right now. Conversation. The, 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 yeah, that's yeah, we're, a, we're way too far down the road. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can, right, so, so you can, you can sit on the river's ledge. Uh, Ms. Gold does bring up a good point. Up. There's there's not a net gain for right. the number of houses that you could potentially put on the property. It's just green space. And I know you that you know this number, but there is a there's a specific number of units that you can build to turn a profit on the development that you have to do with the infrastructure and the soft cost investments. So I know you know what that magic number is. There's probably a minimum number. And if for any reason that gets modified, whether it's through this board or the town board or whatever it is, that's where that threshold would be. Whatever we come back with to look at what the final plan would be, you know, we're going to be looking at a lot of items of maximizing space, characteristics, connectivity. I, I think okay. having any type of walking paths in there, whether you, and connecting the country club makes sense. I mean, if people are worried about golf balls, then. And I've been a row of our course, I've golfed at the people. course before, and I'm an okay golfer. I can tell you, there's not ball sprayed everywhere. No, there's there are. This a higher level golf course, so it's you know the, these things that you that you've done with the connectivity and how you can relate to the neighborhood is a is is something that really should be mm -hmm. thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly explored. It just to the point where it looks like it connects. It looks like it was a natural progression to the houses on rock. And and that's where really where I'm coming from as far as how do you extend a neighborhood and make it look like it was intentional, not this is the final last resort of how you slap on something to the end. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and we have and it, yep. luckily this mm -hmm. unit does not have that, but we as you heard from you know, other people talking and we've done this exploration, at least when we like the comp plan committee members and architect review board, we look at things in a manner of, okay, what are other municipalities doing that aren't beneficial long-term hmm. and we don't want to duplicate yeah, that's right. some of those, some of those developmental patterns. So, yeah. Okay. This was just one thing too, that I heard and I will have to go into the EF and look. Um, but did you want to address the concerns for the hours of construction? Oh, yeah, seven days that's, a week? that's standard fill in the blanks, seven to five <clears> seven <throat> days a week. I, I guarantee you they're not going to be working on Sundays. And in the, in the fall and winter, they're not going to be working on Saturdays probably either. And it's going to be a question of how is the project sequencing? 
Uh, you might be framing one house at a time and maybe three townhouse buildings, but it's not going to be, it's not that big. A, I know it sounds, it's not that big a project. It, it's, yeah, but I mean, it, but it's however so, you capture it in the EAF was what people were. It's, it's not going to be two years of constant construction, five days a week because of the way the sequence is going to run. You build a house in four, a townhouse in four months, a single family custom in five to six. So, and it's only 22. I know I, I'm trying not to minimize it, but it's not a five-year project that goes five, six, seven days a week. It's not going to play out that way. Now, like Harmon Grove, was that 66 units, Laura? Harmon Grove? Harmon Grove is 66. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, was, yeah, I mean, we can, we certainly, Laura, can modify those hours to, you know, that's just a standard you put in seven to five, seven days a week. Well, if somebody wants to go in painting on a Sunday, I don't think that's a noisy activity. Well, our mm -hmm. code actually doesn't require, doesn't allow you to work at 7 a.m. on the weekends, mm -hmm. but it is only 8 a.m., which. Huh. Yeah, we can obviously, we'll change that. It's still Anything else? I think mm -hmm. we have our. Five our, more minutes, we make this a two-day meeting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have, I think we have our path forward, at least, at least a short-term path forward, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Thank you all. I, yeah, well, I just want to thank you and, and, and the public and the board thank, members thank and the you. staff for the long thank meeting. You. And thank you for sticking out in officer party. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate, appreciate you and the residents. Thank you for sticking with us. It's not easy. I know. Yep. You all set? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Have thank a good you. night. Thank you. Yep. Um, the only thing um, I'm going to kind of go, I'm going to like to close out quickly here. So the only thing I think, unless somebody's got something else, I think under reports, just need to mention, uh, uh, Ms. Finnan, the um, probably uh, the, uh, the board might not be uh, aware of the uh, decision uh, for the Article 78 regarding the Miller property. So you just might want to let everybody know what happened there. We didn't hear you. Oh, we didn't hear that. What did you say? The, the, the um, Article 78. Yeah, the Article 78 on BR Holdings property came back and... Um, the court ruled against our ZBA and directed that 54 area variances be granted. Um, it is the town's intention to appeal that decision. Which property is this again? Miller, the right there. Yeah, Ball Town Road between, Town Road between CVS, CVS and WRGB. Yep. Okay. okay. Any other questions at all? No, but thank you, Elena, for all your hard work on that. Thanks, Mr. Well, the hard work's continuing. Yeah, along the right. lines of Article 78. Um, I don't know where the Lou Lisi subdivision on Van Antwerp ever. I know that the our our decision was reversed by the court, but what whatever came of that? The house is that, the, the is house that still being appealed right now. I wasn't here for that, but Laura, well, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it, the town just chose not to appeal yeah, it. We, and, yeah, we chose correct. not to appeal that, and the subdivision was granted. Yeah, I think one home's built and the other one's in process. Yep. Yeah, foundations in and. And we're still working. I think, I think the garage is gone. The garage yeah, we're is gone. the garage is gone. Is gone? And uh, the main house that was there is for sale. I think right. I think you might even have a pending house? offer. Already. Yes. Interestingly, house. it was the same judge, and the two opinions do are kind of conflicting. So same, it same provides same, same, same outcome, and then it overturned the town's decision. But it, they're not consistent opinions it's a little bit of an issue uh, and has interesting powers. yeah it's right down the yes. road that's flowers yes and that's part of the reason why the need to appeal is because in my opinion the decision's a little bit of a mess and doesn't really give us much guidance for the future uh, interesting yep so in the subdivision we we did actually put that the garage had to be in architectural harmony with the historic home and it does require a rain garden to be built on that property, which will have to happen. But I don't think that our subdivision approval actually required a garage to be built. Sure. I think the assumption was that it would. Um, so I suppose there's a possibility that the rain garden and everything would have to go in, but they could, if they decided not to, I don't think they have to build a garage. But most people want one. Um, yeah. Correct. So if the new owners decide to put up a garage, then it would be in keeping with, the, the with our approval. House. Yeah, which but is what don't we put, put in our resolution. Up, yeah. But I don't... You know, I, you know, it goes to tr trying to be as specific as possible in our resolution. The new, the subdivider, um, you know, on, on the face of the conversations with the 
planning board, it sounded like the garage would eminently built, be built after the other one was taken down. And so our condition only spoke to the aesthetics of the garage, not that it would be a requirement to be built. Um, I don't know that it would have changed our conversation that much, but it doesn't appear to be a requirement to be built right. from our subdivision. Yeah, I don't think that's a big deal, actually. So it isn't, but it, but the point is, it's a lesson learned that if we really expect it, then we better better write it down, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it was in the site plan that, you know, I guess I would interpret, if a garage is built, it'll meet these standards, but it yeah. didn't say it had to be built. Yeah. 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 No, no, but I think I mean I'm okay with that. I think leaving that as an option for the bill for the buyer. Well, no, yeah. yeah, agree. Like it's kind of but it's for sale, so if somebody doesn't yeah, care, so the, so the buyer is gonna the buy, you know that yeah. responsibility goes on the buyer. Yeah. Yep. Who doesn't want a garage up in the northeast? <laughs> yep, exactly. And if they do have, want a garage, they'll have to pull out the resolution and they'll be in keeping with the, you know. Okay. All right. Well. All right. Okay. All right, I'm going to just say a motion to adjourn, and thank you, everybody. I have a second? Second. All right. I think you got all adjourned. Seconds. Aye. Seven Aye. seconds. Aye. All right. All right. Thank you again. Mm.